So I was living downtown in a posh building that had a good restaurant next door. The restaurant and the apartment building opened at the same time, so it automatically sort of became where everyone in the building went. And I worked across the street, so it was also where my firm would have client meetings and happy hours and whatnot. So I went in one night alone near closing time, which I had done in the past, and sat at the bar. I had been out that evening to happy hour, but that had been several hours before, and I had been home since then. I ordered a steak dinner and a glass of wine my favorite. I was familiar with the bartender because of the happy hours and one specific first date where the guy I was meeting, who was from Poland, recognized the bartender's accent as Serbian. But they had had some geopolitical banter while we had drinks and the bartender seemed like an okay guy at the time. Mid-twenties, average, nondescript. On this night though, I'm sure that we had some small talk while we worked, but I don't think I actually engaged all that much with him. I didn't even really know his name. Anyway, halfway through my meal, I just get ridiculously tired, like barely keep your eyes open tired. I asked for a box for my meal. He took a while getting it, but when he presented it, he told me that he was walking me home. Obviously, I said, no thanks, and he insisted, three more times, mind you, which at that point, I probably could have used the help walking, but was fully annoyed at being told someone was walking me home. Not only was I clear that he was not welcome to do that, I actually had a habit of never letting a guy walk me to any door. I don't like randos to know where I live and I once had an acquaintance try to push in with me after an all-building cocktail party. So yeah, there was no way that this was going to happen, no matter what. I remember I got loud and with a final no, and I took a few more sips of wine. Hey, I paid 20 bucks for that glass and I was not going to waste it as I stood to leave. He seemed a little taken aback. He snatched up my glass and said that he was coming with me, so I remember that I simply left before he could do or say anything else. And well, I made it next door to my apartment and I was going in the elevator. I could hardly walk though and I felt beyond drunk, even though I had barely finished half of my glass of wine. And when I made it to the eighth floor, I could barely stand. I literally crawled from the elevator down my very long hallway, around the corner and almost to my door. And when I got within feet of my door, my legs had officially stopped working. I could barely climb up the door to insert the key, but somehow I managed to do it, and then I dragged myself over the threshold. I woke up the next day, slumped against my door, and I had wet myself. Now... I had never lost control of my body like that, no matter how drunk I've gotten, and I definitely have never slept on the floor when I dropped. It was honestly crazy and unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. I had a hangover from hell and I was trying to figure out all day what had happened. I told myself that since I'd been at happy hour earlier, maybe I was drunk and didn't know it when I went for my late meal. But I didn't remember feeling drunk when I was there, and I hadn't really eaten until the steak and the potatoes that I'd ordered. I kept searching for a reason, and it was a couple of days before I remembered how overly familiar the bartender had been in trying to walk me home. It chilled me what could have happened if that guy had walked me home. I had no proof that he had done anything, but somehow I, I just knew it was him. I felt stupid that I'd gone back out that night when I could have just eaten at home and I felt stupid for not watching him more closely, even though I'd been alone at a bar. I felt stupid for going to the bar at all when I could have eaten at a table, but I just couldn't be sure enough of anything to report it to anywhere. I just kind of hid for a couple of months, refusing to walk by the window in front of the bar side of the restaurant and generally avoiding that corner altogether. And it was at least two months before I go back to that restaurant, and even then, it was only for work. I was relieved though when I didn't see him at the bar but I had to ask in case he was coming later or something and when I asked where he was, the person behind the bar said really flatly, oh yeah, him, he's gone, but well, we had to let him go. I remember searching the bartender's face for a clue and picked up on some mild disgust, so I said good or something to that effect and he started to talk but thought better of it and the conversation ended pretty much there. In the end, I have no idea where that guy ended up or what happened and why he was fired, but 
I'm almost 100% certain that I was drugged that night and he was trying to take me home. My experience took place when I was no older than four or five years old, trying to take a nap in my bedroom on the second story of our apartment building. The only way that I can describe what happened is that shortly after I laid down, I witnessed something lightweight and small being chucked at me from across the room, coming from near my toy box. My toy box was on a wall with no window and my bedroom door was to the left of it. I picked up the thing that landed on my bedspread and thought, at least in my four-year-old mind, that it looked a lot like a dried orange peel. The more years that pass, I realize it could have been something else, but I have no idea what. Super confused and not scared at first, I ran out to the hallway expecting my stepdad to have been out there playing a joke on me. But that was the only explanation that I could think of at the time. Maybe he had flicked it from under the door or something, but... He was across the apartment and was surprised to see that I was awake and chided me for getting up when I was supposed to be sleeping. When he took me back to my room, the peel was nowhere to be found and he thought that I was lying to get out of my nap. Somewhat nervously, I climbed back into bed and laid awake for about maybe 5 or 10 minutes before I felt another tap of another peel hitting my bedspread. Scared at this point, I remember looking at my window and making sure it was shut. Meanwhile, another one flew out of nowhere and hit my skin. I remember diving under the covers and seeing the silhouettes of them landing on the blanket near my face and when they stopped, there was nothing on my bed. When my mum came home from work, I told her everything that happened and both of my parents laughed at me and tried to convince me that it must have been a dream. Sometime later, maybe a couple of days or weeks, they go by and I was sitting on my bedroom floor playing quietly when I discover the same kind of dried orange peel thing in the bottom of my toy box in a corner. I grabbed it and immediately ran to show my mum, who was completely taken aback, but after she composed herself, she just threw it away and told me that it was nothing. For the years that we stayed in that apartment, I would occasionally find the orange peels on different parts of the carpet, in drawers, just all over the place, and yes, my room was cleaned and I wasn't allowed to eat in there, so it was weird. Anyways, I know that this is a super weird and random experience, but I was curious to hear any thoughts that you guys might have. The only thing that I've been able to find out online is that orange peels can be burned to ward off demons, but at this point... I don't remember exactly what it looked like, and my mum claims to not remember too. Also, our apartment was in Salem, Oregon, on a massive Native American burial site too. I know that a lot of Salem is an Indian burial ground, but this part of Salem is especially known for it. And this is the only paranormal experience that I'm taking to my grave swearing by. After my mum laughed off what I had told her, I remember telling myself for years that Jesus will tell them that you weren't lying in heaven someday, which was kind of my way of getting back at them at the time. Anyways, sorry for the long story and I know it's not that exciting as the other experiences on here, but it was a weird one and I just thought I would share it with you guys. I've had sleep paralysis before. My older sister is convinced that it was just that, but I have a deep feeling that it wasn't. To begin, I live in Colorado, just outside of Denver, in the metro area in a nicely populated neighborhood right off of a major highway. I literally live one street away from the highway, and as a kid, I was convinced for some reason that I was an alien or some sort of alien experiment and I genuinely have no idea where this thought came from. I'd assumed, of course, that it was just kid silliness. I'd probably watched Escape to Witch Mountain or E.T. too many times or something. Either way, I haven't thought about aliens in a long time, and I was starting to doubt that they actively visit our planet. Anyways, here's what happened. So in the middle of dreaming, I woke up suddenly to a feeling of alertness and dread. This intense feeling of terror came over me and I felt an immediate urge to run, scream and cry. But I had a very strong feeling that I should stay still and not move at all as well. I was going to get out of bed but the instinct not to move was just too strong to ignore so I just stayed there. 
and then there was a white square light hovering above me. It was about three feet inside and made up of smaller lights arranged in a square formation. There was a strange humming emanating from it and I realized that I couldn't hear my fan or the cars on the highway like I usually can. The terror came full force at this realization and I wanted so badly to run and scream but the instinct that I needed to be quiet and stay there was too strong to ignore again. I wanted so badly to get up but I knew that I just shouldn't. Despite my terror, I didn't even allow myself to cry and I started quietly whispering, I want to stay with my mum, I'm going to stay with my mum. And then the humming stopped, my fan started whirring again and the light was just gone. Immediately after that, I felt very, very sleepy and I could feel that I was forgetting what had just happened, but I decided that I wasn't going to let myself forget and I went and turned the light on and started crying for a long time. My older sister ended up calling me and tried to convince me that it was my anxiety and I was having sleep paralysis, but this just didn't really feel like it. I knew in my mind that I could move, I just had a feeling that I shouldn't move. Like I said too, I've had sleep paralysis before and I know how to fight it and deal with it calmly. I, uh, I feel crazy even talking about it. I feel so, so crazy, but something definitely happened to me and thinking about it, I feel like this happened before because I wanted to forget. And this time I wish that I had forgotten again in some ways. If anyone can relate to this experience, please let me know in the comments below. I'm honest to God hoping that this was just sleep paralysis, but I feel so strongly that it just wasn't. So, the other night my friends and I were drinking and we stumbled into the realm of scary stories and every single one of us had paranormal experiences, except this one friend, D. He doesn't really believe in the supernatural stuff, but he still told us this story that one of his friends that he knows since middle school told him. I'm going to tell this just like he did as well. So, my friend is an avid Tinder user. He goes on a lot of dates, and this one time he was chatting with a girl, very shy but cute and all. So, they finally meet, and she's okay. They have a lot in common, and they have a really good time. However, this girl seems to be increasingly nervous as time goes by. Finally, they're about to say their goodbyes and she says something along the lines of not wanting to go home. When my friend asks why, she replies it's because her new house is really scary and, being honest, she would be very grateful to get my friend to sleep over just so that she could feel more at ease. But my friend thought, okay, we'll sleep, wink wink. She clarified soon enough though that she didn't want to have sex and my friend was fine with that too. He drove them to the girl's house and it's definitely kind of creepy. He feels a little uneasy but not enough to prevent them from ending up fooling around though they kept their clothes on. They slept on the same bed and at some point of the night my friend wakes up to go to the bathroom which was a hallway away from the main bedroom. He goes, does his business and when he comes out... He sees a dark figure just standing there in the dark. For a second, he thinks it's the girl and he calls her name. The figure moves and starts walking on the opposite direction and shit, that's definitely not the girl. He bolts to the bedroom at this point, scared to death and his soul flies even farther from him when he sees the girl is not in bed. In fact, there's no trace of her anywhere. He looks up and down from the bathroom to the kitchen and she isn't there and nor did it seem like she ever was to begin with. He eventually got his things from the bedroom and just left the house as fast as he could. Drove aimlessly for around 30 minutes until he could calm himself down and then he just drove home. When he finished we asked if the Tinder profile still existed after the girl mysteriously disappeared and Dee says that he doesn't think so but isn't certain. I'll fully admit that it seems kind of fictional, but Dee's friend swears by it and at that moment, a little tipsy, it seemed pretty creepy for me. I have some more stories from that afternoon too and maybe I'll share them as well if you'd like to hear them. My friends are okay with me sharing their stories too as long as I don't share anything too personal like addresses and whatnot. Anyway, thanks for listening.
But recently, I had a pretty strange experience with someone or something in the Walmart parking lot. I work during the day and I really only have time to go shopping at night. Unfortunately, I get off around 10.30 every night and by the time that I get home, it's already past 11. My boyfriend also works 12-hour shifts, so I prefer not to bother him with anything when we get off of work. So the other night, the Walmart parking lot was actually really full, so I had to park all the way in the back. The back of the vast parking lot is usually pretty deserted, but there are street lights to keep things pretty visible. And while I was walking up to the Walmart front doors, I felt something had brushed my hair. Now, this is South Carolina in the summer, so I thought initially a bug had flown into my hair or something. However, I vigorously combed through it with my fingers. Admittedly, I hate bugs, but found nothing. I assumed that whatever had touched my hair did not get tangled in my thick curly locks and eventually just flew away, and so I felt it, but by the time I tried to get rid of it, it was gone. After picking up my groceries, I walked back to the car and did not have any problems. By the time that I got home, it was already 1am. You know there aren't any open aisles at Walmart at night, so every checkout takes forever. My boyfriend was already asleep and the dogs were in the crate, so after I put my groceries up, I had some time to myself. I was watching some trash TV and eventually dozed off on the couch. I was only asleep for a few moments before I felt something touch my hair gently. It's really difficult for me to wake up immediately, so while I felt my hair move, I didn't immediately respond. I thought the sensation had stopped and was slowly falling back into a deep sleep, but as soon as I started to fade out again, something pulled my hair. I threw myself off the couch and looked around, but the bedroom door where my boyfriend and dogs were was still closed and I could hear the faint sounds of him snoring. I checked the entire house, made sure all the doors were locked and slept with my bedroom door locked as well that night. Every night before I go to bed, I brush my hair out now and it's really thick and curly and really difficult to manage and, and if I don't brush it and put oil in it, I'll wake up the next day completely matted down so I brush my hair out, put coconut leave in and conditioner in it and tied it up and I went to sleep. But when I woke up the next morning, my hair tie was on the bed and my hair was matted, only on one side, the left side where... I swore that someone was pulling my hair the other night. I went to the bathroom and brushed out the matted side and I felt this searing pain in my scalp. I couldn't really see anything in the mirror but I took a picture with my phone and my scalp was red with little specks of blood and what looked like some sort of bruising. Today is day four and I haven't been able to relax since then and I'm not sure if I'm going crazy or if something may have followed me home. This happened around eight or nine years ago. I was in a mall with my daughter and as a weekend treat, decided to go to a local cake store to sample a slice of their chocolate mousse. A few minutes after getting seated, my phone rang. It said that my sister was calling. She was at work at the time and was not allowed phones in the production area, so I was concerned that it may be important. When I picked up and said hello, a really, really creepy and kind of oily voice that I didn't recognize said, Oh, so you're just here eating cake, are you? I think I may have said a few other things, asked the name, why they were calling, something like that, and the voice just laughed and laughed. It was difficult to identify as male or female as well, and all I know is that it was really, really wrong. Like, the voice was distorted or something. I looked around and I remember thinking that I was probably a victim of one of those gag shows or something, but then again, why go through all the effort of using my sister's name and number just for a prank call? I eventually hung up and looked at my daughter. She was still eating cake. The people around us were minding their own business and the world just stayed the same. I eventually told my sister after and she had no idea what I was talking about. There was no call log on her phone that showed that she dialed me and I don't remember if it showed on mine but it was a long time ago and I still have no idea what happened.
Ever since I was young, I've always seen and heard things that are definitely unexplainable. I'm 18 now, and I still do, all the time. I'm used to being the only one who has had these weird experiences, and also being the only one who sees it. But when I was younger, it was terrifying, I admit, but now I just kind of brush it off and continue living my life the way I do. And before I continue, just know that I don't suffer from any mental illnesses that may cause me to see things. I've only been diagnosed with depression once, and for those concerned, I'm on medication and I'm stable. And so I guess I'll give you guys the top three creepiest encounters that I've had. Though I do have many more, but the thing about these ones is that they're the ones that got me to realize that there's some things that we can or cannot see and are just unexplainable. So I was 13 when this happened, and sadly I don't have evidence of this event because 1. I had no phone at that age, and 2. I had a tablet, but I'm not going to whip out anything to record anything when shit hits the fan. I was sick, and no one was home that day but me and my awesome pit bull Sugar. She's my favorite fat nugget. My mum was at an appointment, my dad was at work, and my younger brother was of course at school. I was home alone and bored out of my mind, just laying on the couch watching random stuff on TV, so I decided to go and put the dishes away from the dishwasher into the cabinets where they belong. First, I put away glass cups and the cabinet where the cups go is just above the dishwasher. And before I continue, I always had this irrational thought every time that I put anything away in the cabinets, that I always made sure that they weren't close to the ledge so it doesn't fall on my head or break the counter or the floor. Normally, there would be two inches of space away from the ledge, and I always made sure that I pushed them as far back as I could until I hear the glass clink, if you know what I mean. I was finishing up on the last glass cup, placing it in the cabinet. I look up to make sure all of them are where they belong, and I look down to close the dishwasher, and then I hear a glass break. I jumped a little and looked to see a broken glass in the middle of the kitchen. And once I see it, the door to enter into the garage opens wide. Sometimes the door handle is crappy and it'll open on occasion. It started doing it this year, but it definitely only opens a crack, not wide open like this. So I just stare in shock and Sugar started barking at the opening to the garage. I knew damn well that I was too sick for this weird shit, so I ran to close the door, quickly clean up the glass the best that I could. The glass went everywhere, mind you, and I ran into my room with Sugar. My dog is not aggressive, but that time, she was pissed at whatever was there. I mean, she's a fat nugget, like I said, who I share my food with all the time. She normally barks at random strangers and neighbors outside from the front window, near the front door, or barks at the fences in the backyard, but never towards the garage. My dog is never intimidating too, but that time... I was actually scared that she was after something or someone because the way she was growling just was not normal. So the next story happened when I was about 11. I have a sister who was a drug addict and was then as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that too because I'm still healing from what I went through because of her. I still love her by the way but I just don't want to get involved with her anymore and there's just no point. Anywho, me and her were forced to share this room that is now my own before she decided to move out. I don't remember a lot of the arguments. All I remember was that I was pissed at her enough to want her to sleep in our living room and away from me. But we have two living rooms, my parents and the kids' living room. Ours is where you enter from the front door and there you are. There's also a doorway to enter the other living room and I had my pillow and blanket with me because I was the one who had to go sleep there and I was by myself in the dark. And then I noticed a white pale face staring at me through my parents' living room window. At first I thought my eyes were just playing tricks on me until it moved closer to the window as if it wanted a better look at me. So I froze and then I realized that I needed to get to the restroom which was close to get away from this thing. But knowing my luck, I thought at the time, it was only going to get worse. The face that was staring at me, it had big black eyes and pale skin, almost white skin, and I was about to get up until I heard a metal clinging. And it was indeed getting closer. I still saw whoever the hell was at the window, but the sound came from the kitchen. And slowly, it moved into my parents' living room, and just as I was about to piss myself, I screamed at the top of my lungs. 
and my sister, still being up, comes running out and started holding me and asked what was going on. I told her to run back into the room. Her being freaked out by what I said, we ran back into our room and I even locked the door. Of course, she kept asking questions and so I explained to her what happened. Let's just say that we didn't sleep until the sun came up that night. All I can say is that I just felt an intense hostility in the air when I saw and heard whatever the hell that was. It was so bad that my chest was hurting and... It actually took a while for me to recover from that and to be able to be in the living room at night again after that. And to this day, even now some nights, I still get sketched out. So the last story, I highly debated on which one to tell you guys. I've had a lot of scary experiences that would make anyone be fearful of me in my home. But not all of my experiences were actually from here. In fact, over half were in different locations. So my parents had divorced at this time because my biological father was an abusive and cheating asshole who can't stop planting his seeds anywhere. But they split when I was three and now my mum is loved and respected by a man that I do call my dad. When really he's my stepdad but he's that awesome that I consider him as my own. I do love the guy and I started spending weekends with him when I was 13 and stopped when I was 16. My stepmom has been with him and I got a baby sister from them both. She's seven now, but when this happened, she was three and I was 14. So normally, my stepmom would pick me up and my younger brother up on Fridays to take us home on Sundays. It was a Friday and by this time, I've come to terms that I can see things. On our way to bio dads, my stepmom decided to tell me that my baby sister hasn't been behaving and that she has an imaginary friend named Creepy. And immediately, that was a red flag. When kids develop imaginary friends, be very cautious, especially when they can see them at eye level to them. It's likely something demonic or bad-spirited that wants something from them. So at this point, I'm now pretty alarmed and once we get there, I go to talk to my baby sister. She, of course, greeted me with hugs and kisses and I was glad to see her but most definitely worried. I immediately asked her about Creepy and her smile quickly changed into a blank expression. She whispered that he's under daddy's bed and that was enough for me to pick her up and talk to her in the living room about whoever the fuck was in there. She told me that he had human teeth and how he likes to play at night. I told her to never talk to him again. She was sad because she's young. She doesn't understand the risk of whether or not this creepy dude had good intentions or not. I calmed her down and told her that she wasn't in trouble but to just stay away from creepy. Then I go into Bio Dad's room and he explained more to me about what he saw. He has bad sleeping habits so in the middle of the night he would wake up and be awake for hours. And one night he looked to check to see if my sister was in bed and she wasn't. Instead he saw her facing the corner just standing there. And this was around 3 in the morning and soon after that she would just yell at nothing to leave her alone and let her sleep. Whatever it was that was screwing with her was starting to mess with her more. That night I was already alarmed so I stayed up with my sister and everyone else went to bed. And soon enough, I saw something standing over her, watching her. Now, in the past when I've seen things, I see flashes of images of what they look like before they passed or whatnot. But with this though, it manifested in front of me which seemed a lot more powerful than normal. And there it was, standing and watching her sleep. I screamed at this thing to leave her alone and everyone woke up but my brother. I turned on the light. My sister was awake the whole time but she said that she was so scared to move. She said that she told me no and that he was now mad at me. I made her sleep with me since she was afraid of sleeping alone at this point. And when everyone went back to bed, it wasn't done with us just yet. At this point, I've got some idea of how to protect myself and others and I was no longer afraid. If anything, I was actually angry. I mean, it was messing with my baby sister. I saw it again, standing near the doorway to my bio dad's room facing the living room where me and my sister were. Then, I got flashes of what it was while it was stepping closer to me. And all I can say is that it felt terrible. Each image that I saw of this face it was nothing but darkness and its human fucking teeth. When I turned on the light, it was hiding. 
I went to the kitchen and grabbed some sea salt and poured it on every window and every doorway. I prayed and finally said with those with evil intent that you're not welcome here. I turned off the lights and there it was, more pissed off but now I had the upper hand. I just kept yelling that it wasn't welcome here and told it to leave over and over again. And then it just disappeared. It was gone. The energy felt clear and my sister never saw nor talked about him again. But one time she cried at warm-up because she saw something and said it looked like creepy, but other than that, I think I won the fight. Over time, I've learned what to do to protect myself and it's definitely not always easy, but it does help. I'm not afraid like I used to be. These bad experiences taught me lessons to keep having faith in the most difficult times or situations. I really don't know for certain which religion to believe in when it comes to good versus evil, but all I do know is that there is definitely good and evil in this world. Some we can see and some we can't. Anyway, I know some people aren't going to believe me because some people are just flat out skeptics and that's okay, I expect that. But I hope you guys enjoyed the story and I can confirm that everything that I said, I believe, is 100% the truth. So this happened back in mid-October of 2010. I think it was October the 13th, probably a Wednesday. I have a pretty good memory. So me, 18, my cousin Anna, 18, and my sister Ashley, 14, and my sister's boyfriend Bob, 16, were all hanging out at my house and, like we usually did, we decided that we wanted to go and smoke. So Bob hit up one of his friends who told him that we could meet up at the Shell, which was about a mile or two straight down the road from my house. Literally a two-minute drive. The problem was, nobody had a car, so he would have to walk to go and get it. But not really a big deal, like I said, it wasn't that far. The only problem was that it was dark outside because it was fall. So even at like 6pm it's already really dark in New England and the road that I live on leading up to the shell goes downhill. And it's all flat ground with only one street light in front and each an abandoned shopping plaza that is now used as a truck yard. It's quite dark so he and my sister decided that they're going to go walk together to get the stuff. Now, my cousin Anna and I, being the bored kids that we were, thought that we would go and follow them less than 10 minutes after they left. I'm a very on edge type of person. I've seen a million and one horror movies and I also have hypervigilance so going outside at night in the dark on a long stretch of quiet road is very out of character for me. In the daytime I walk this road with no problem but at night it's uh, pretty creepy. But I wanted to get out of the house and I didn't want to look like a chicken. So we started walking and the further we get away from my house I already feel nervous for some reason like I shouldn't be outside in the cold at night by myself even though I live in a safe small town albeit bordered by a larger scary city and that is where the shell is located and it just seems cold so we walk faster to try and catch up with Ashley and Bob but they're too far ahead of us. Well, we keep walking and eventually we make it down the hill and we're approaching the truck stop and I'm relieved because there's finally a street light again. But suddenly, my relief is cut short. I just feel a deep sense of dread in the pit of my stomach as I see a small car drive up to us and slowly stop. I looked, wide-eyed, into the car and I see four men in these terrifying flesh-colored expressionless masks just staring at us. I immediately lose it, scream as loud as I can and start running backwards into the dark where all the trucks are. The car takes off and I run up to Anna, who at this point is laughing, something she does when she's nervous or scared, and I tell her that we need to hide immediately because they're going to come back and look for us. So we bolt over to this old shopping cart port that looks like it had a car inside of it, but really it only has the top half of the car so you wouldn't think someone could be hiding in there. We kneel down and peek our eyes out and what do you know, this car comes circling back into the truck yard super slowly right in front of us. I am just watching them look for us just frozen in fear. They stop dead in their tracks looking at the carport and then they leave. I had my phone on me but it didn't have service at the time and Anna didn't have a phone so our only options at this point were to keep walking and be vulnerable to whoever was in that car finding us again or call the cops. I obviously called the cops. 
for some reason they didn't take us very seriously. They thought it was a Halloween prank because we actually found out that they targeted my sister and Bob who got split up. My sister said that they followed her as she was walking with Bob and said that they kept driving past him. But I don't think it was a prank. I mean, they weren't wearing like silly or crazy masks. Well, the masks that they had on were pretty creepy and had no expression. Plus, they all had on black hoodies and... Something tells me that they were from the projects across the street from the shell and were either looking for someone to kidnap, rob, or possibly worse. For whatever reason, my sister and Bob weren't as affected as me, but whenever I bring this story up to Anna, she just doesn't want to talk about it. And no, they were never caught. I'm around 18 years old at the time, sitting in my bedroom and, no bullshit, watching The Purge for the first time. My bedroom window only had one latch out of the two locked because I would smoke out of it at night, being too afraid to go outside alone around 1am. Now, during the movie, I kept hearing a light scratching sound and I thought it was probably just another cat under the house or something. After about five minutes, I pause the movie and hear it again, but this time it's a little bit louder. Getting kind of creeped out, I reached under my curtain and pushed the unlocked side of my window down and locked it. Looking back, the fact that that one part of the window was fucking pried open definitely should have alarmed me. But I sit back down and I hear a loud slam come from the bathroom. I run out to go and check and the blinds have fallen off. I ran straight to my parents' bedroom and my dad immediately knew that something was wrong. He gets up in all of his manly glory with a 45 and his tight white undies and runs out of the back door to search the yard. He didn't see anyone and we decided to call the cops in the morning. My nephew was staying overnight that night and we figured that there was no point in freaking him out over what we felt was nothing. So the next day we take a look around. My window had scratch marks from a fucking crowbar and the ledge was dented as if someone was actually trying to pry my window open. And whoever it was wore socks on their hands or something to try and push up the glass because there were no handprints. There were just two long and dragged out marks the size of adult hands going up with it. Mind you, my windows were very dirty so it was pretty easy to see. But we lived in a very small town in Louisiana so the police chief, who knew my parentals, came to the house for a formal report. He kept insisting that it was either a friend or maybe a boyfriend who couldn't get in touch with me. But one, everyone I know knew my dad was always well armed and did not play that shit. Two, my cell is always on and I always answer, especially for friends at one in the morning. Three, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Friends don't wear socks on their hands and try to jimmy your window open late at night. At least, not without calling out your name first. We never did find out who it was or what they wanted. And what still scares me, even 10 years later, is that the house was not quiet. The TV and my lamp or two were on in the living room. The bathroom light was on and my bedroom was very well lit since I was watching a horror movie. Yet, this person still tried to get in through two different windows? The worst part is that if our bathroom window weren't so shitty, they would have made it in too. To keep it open, my mum would use an old broom handle to hold it up and unless there's something keeping it up, it immediately slams back down, which is most likely why the blinds came down and a loud slam was heard. It may just be me, but I'm pretty sure that whoever it was wanted something from in our house so badly that they didn't care who was inside or if they were awake. And if I would have opened that curtain before locking my window, it could have either scared them off or possibly motivated them more to get in if their face was seen. Either way, it was a near miss, for sure. My mother, my grandma and I live in the same house but in two different flats in a very short street with only six houses total. We moved here in 2012 and everything was fine. One day though, there was an old man moving into another house in the street. He seemed really nice, but my image of him changed quickly when the incidents began. My grandma lives in the first floor, so everyone walking past the house can technically look into her flat when she has the blinds open. 
and she started telling us about how she'd seen sometimes, two feet under the blinds of the big windows, always the same shoes. One day, she pulls them up while the shoes are there and guess who it is? Yeah, the old man. Turns out that he's been watching her for quite some time through her windows and even from his balcony, from which he has a perfect view of the big window in her living room. As if that wasn't bad enough though, he started talking to me when I got home from school because I need to pass by his house. We didn't know each other, but we had nothing to do with each other, not even remotely, so it was a bit strange. He begins asking though how I was, if school was finally over and so on. I didn't like that, but I just politely answered. And one day, he started asking about my grandma and mother, how they're going, etc., and I was a little bit creeped out by this, given the history of the incidences, so I just started ignoring him and after a few days of that, he eventually got the hint. Now, my grandma has a sort of caregiver who comes to her flat twice a week to clean and go grocery shopping with her because she can't walk or bend over that well anymore, but this caregiver is also the one that comes to our stalking neighbor to help him. After my grandma brought it up that he had been watching her the other day, the caregiver told us that the old man would want hugs from her, look at her ass, with cleavage and everything, and also sometimes touch her in places like her waist or her thighs unintentionally. And as if this wasn't already more than terrifying, he also rides the bus sometimes, and sometimes I'm in that same bus or he even rides the school bus for some weird reason. Anyways, one day I was waiting for the bus and there was a girl with a hijab, a headscarf, waiting for the bus too. The man walks up to her and starts talking to her. I had my headphones in so, out of curiosity, I put one out and listened to what he was talking about. And I was shocked when I heard how he was talking about immigrants being a problem for us and how they should get out of our country and such, but in a way that he didn't say it directly but rather hinted at those things. The girl was really confused, obviously, and then the bus already came, which she was relieved about, understandably too. I mean, how awkward. But this guy's creepy behavior just seems to be escalating, and I don't know, what do you guys think we should do? So this happened about six years ago when I used to take long walks or hikes to clear my mind and just enjoy being by myself. I always love the woods and exploring new paths and getting lost on purpose because I've got pretty good orientation sense and I never actually got confused or actually lost. But there was this one time when it was a little different. So I went into the woods, it was a clear sunny day and I remember taking a new path by changing the direction because I was bored. I came to a certain area and everything just started to feel strange for a good amount of time, like feeling dread the whole time that I was walking. And what was weird is that it was just a feeling that just kind of happened suddenly. But there was kind of no rhyme or reason for it, it just kind of happened. I came to a certain crossroad with a map built into the wooden board. I figured where I was approximately and set off exactly in the opposite direction from the board. I remember hearing very strange music playing from a far distance and didn't give much attention to it. Also, the sun was shining on my back when walking by the right side of the road the whole time since I set off. After walking for like 10 minutes, there was pretty rough paths leading into the woods where the music was coming from, but to my right. I walked a little further that way and figured that the music was just still playing far away in the distance. Even when I walked that direction for like a good mile, it just always seemed to stay in that distance. So, anyways, I came back to the main road and continued walking the right side for a good 30 minutes. And after that, I began to see certain objects in the distance. I thought it was another crossroad, but as I was nearing it, I dropped into ultimate fear and disbelief because the object was the same crossroad that I set off from in the beginning. It started to get dark out pretty soon after that, which was kind of weird because it wasn't that long after that that I got there. But for some unknown reason too, I just had this disastrous feeling that if I don't run, that something very wrong is about to happen. And so, I did. And everything was fine after that. 
Now, when it all happened, I quickly started reasoning with myself that maybe I didn't realize and went the other direction from the path that I walked to find the source of the music, but the path that I encountered was a short walk from the crossroad or something, and when I was walking, I just kind of circled back or something. But after thinking about it for some time, I just don't think that that's possible. The thing was is that the sun was shining to my front, which doesn't make any sense. I also remember these details pretty vividly and I couldn't and still can't find any rational reason about what happened because the two things that I described just didn't make any sense and I've tried to disprove this theory but I just can't. My friends and I, for the past two years, go on vacations and pick where we stay by Airbnb. Last year, we had no problems, even though the house wasn't the nicest, but this year, we were sure that it was going to be a better experience. We got a house through this one man who had amazing reviews, and he was even verified on the app for the reviews that he got. When we got to the house, nothing seemed wrong. It was an amazing deal and was a really nice place, only a mile from the beach, which was nice. I never go into a house or a place that I'm staying at though and think that it might be haunted or someone was in there or anything so I just didn't think much of it. Now the house was set up as the following. You walk in and on the right is a room with a bunk bed and a pull out bed. I slept in there along with my friends E and N. On the left from the front door is the living room with a pull out bed. The first night we slept there my friend D slept out on the pull out couch. But when you walk through the living room it's the dining room and the kitchen. There was a back door in the kitchen that led out to the backyard. Before going into the kitchen, if you walked right, there was a hallway with a bathroom and then another room with a double bed. My friend H and her girlfriend slept there, and next to that, my friend C and A slept together in another double bed. There was a basement too that we were only able to get into from the backyard and by using the house key. Like I said, nothing happened the first night and we were actually having a lot of fun. We went to the beach that night and got food and came back and played some drinking games. The next day we all went to the beach and the only bad thing about the house was it had one bathroom for like eight people. Me, D, H and a girlfriend went back before the other four to shower and just get ready for dinner and whatnot so it saved some time. D went downstairs into the basement to check it out and we were all shocked to find out just how nice it actually was down there. It was all redone with a huge couch, some game tables, and a nice place for the washer and dryer. D decided that he would actually rather sleep down there since it was more space and he would have his own little room. His room is actually in his basement at his house and so he's used to it and doesn't get freaked out by anything like that. So that night we go for dinner and everyone came home. D went to bed in the basement and we made sure that we locked the door and all the doors and the windows were locked. I get up at around 2am and go to the bathroom by walking through the living room and the dining room. But the street didn't have any street lights and since all the lights were off in the house it was actually completely pitch black in the house. I didn't bring my phone or anything and everyone was sleeping since we went to bed pretty early that night. I walk through the dining room and the living room and then I suddenly just got a weird feeling. In the pitch black I was in the living room and I just felt something. It felt as if someone was standing in the corner of the living room maybe. It was like the feeling if you're in a room with someone who just walks in but your back is to them and you just kind of feel someone in the room with you. It wasn't D since he was definitely in the basement. Plus we locked the door so he couldn't come up even if he wanted to. I was frozen because I knew someone was in there. But the only thing that I could do was run through the living room and go to my room and lock the door. I didn't say anything to my friends because they like to think that I'm paranoid about things and I know they wouldn't take me seriously anyway. The next day when we went to bed, I was the one to sleep on the pull-out bed. There was a window in my room right above my bed since it was on the floor. Everyone was sleeping and I was on my phone since I go to bed pretty late. At the house next to us had a driveway that was on the other side of their house so it wasn't on our side. And something caught my attention from the window. It kind of looked like a, a light maybe. I thought it was a car light pulling into the driveway but I realized the driveway was on the other side of the house. 
So I looked up and I definitely saw a shadow of someone. And then it looked like an outline of a head looking into the window through the blinds. It could have been my imagination, but since I just saw the light, it made me even more nervous. I was texting my friend from home and I was telling her how scared I was and when I looked back, it was gone. Which definitely means that something was there. The light and the thing that looked like a head had just disappeared though. She was texting me telling me that it was probably nothing. And the next morning was when I told my friends E and N. They of course thought that I was joking and just overreacting. So I just kind of let it go because I knew what I was seeing and what I felt but they were never going to believe me anyway. The next day though, or the day after that, the right of us split up again. Me, D and H and her girlfriend going up to the shower before anyone else. The other four came back though and while Em was in the shower, everyone else was in the living room just talking and sitting on their phones waiting for her and there was a window in the shower with curtains but the glass was foggy and blurry so people from outside can't look in when you're showering. Em walks out in her towel and looks at all of us and goes, who's tapping on the window? We all look at her and told her that no one since we were all on the couch the whole time. She looked at us like she didn't believe us and asked again. We assured her though that we were all in the room the whole time, but she said that it sounded like someone was tapping on the window and since she thought that it was one of us, she tapped back twice. And a few seconds later, whatever it was, tapped back at her twice. I looked at her and she made a face at me, finally thinking that what I've been seeing could definitely be real. Nothing else happened when we were on that trip, but I never get the feeling as if some place is haunted or there's someone in a house. And that was the actual first time that I've ever been scared to stay somewhere and I just can't explain what it was. So my boyfriend recently moved to the city and got this room in this student building. But to explain, we have three different levels and each level is the same. It has four individual doors with individual locks. Each door is a separate room that you can rent. So you share a shower, a toilet, a kitchen. But overall, it's kind of like having your own place. More like an apartment than a house though. He lives on the third floor and we recently bought a cabinet for his place. So as we were lifting the cabinet through the front door, this guy also comes into the building with us. We politely let him pass because lifting the thing upstairs is going to take a long time. I smile at him and say hello and then I see his face. And legit, all of my stranger danger alarms just start going off for some reason. He had this weird smile like a satisfied smug smile. He towered over me and I saw his dirty moustache that barely even was a moustache. And that kind of thing that a 14 year old grows. And nothing is really there yet, just here and there some kind of hairs. And also, his hair looked really greasy and he just looked dirty if I have to be honest. We noticed that he went to the second floor though, so that was lucky for us. My boyfriend and I ignore it, but once we get upstairs, we both agree that he creeped us out. But we tried not to judge and we just let it go. Like a week or so later, we have a dog over. We go and walk him in the evening, and it was still light outside at this time. As we start to walk back to the building, we spot the creepy guy and have to pass him because of the way that he was walking. It was weird though, because it was kind of like he was walking in slow motion, and not a care in the world with, again, the satisfied smug smile on his face. But that was not what creeped us out. Looking at his face, we realized that there was no way that he was sober. He looked really out of this world and very noticeably was on drugs. In that moment, the way he walked and the way he looked, I just got some really bad vibes from him and I didn't want to be close to him at all and my stranger danger alarms were going off again. This happened near the city center as well. So my boyfriend and I decide not to walk back with him to the building and we take another route just to avoid walking with him and we take our time to make sure that he's in his room before we enter the building. But this is the creepy part. 
So three weeks before our first encounter with this guy, someone randomly got murdered while he was jogging near the school campus, stabbed and died instantly. The suspect had been seen at the time near the campus and so a drawing of the suspect had been released, but they didn't have him and didn't really have anything to work with. And now, just today, my boyfriend and I got back from this walk at like four in the afternoon when we noticed someone in a suit standing outside. Didn't really think much of it, if I'm being honest. But later that night, the guy who lives next door catches me as I got back from the bathroom and asked me if we already have a key at the front door. I say yes, that we have one. Why? And he said that the police had to break the door down, so he was in charge of getting everyone new keys. My boyfriend at this time joins us together with the person who lives at the other side of us and I asked what happened. And apparently, the guy who killed the person near campus lived on the second floor. And legit, my hair starts standing up straight when I hear this. I ask if he could have seen how he looked and he told me that he was tall, black hair with a weird moustache and looks kind of dirty. And it was the creepy dude that we saw those times. My boyfriend and I are still in just utter shock that we live so close to this murderer, someone who walked around near the city centre and cooked his dinner in the shared kitchen while he took someone's life. Someone that I smiled to and even said hello to and tried to avoid. In 2018, my boyfriend Jonathan and I moved into our first apartment together. We were so excited too that we would have our own place and finally be adults. But it didn't take long in our new apartment to spot the complex's resident weirdo. He lived in our building on the third floor. We were on the first floor. He was in his late 50s, early 60s and had a face that seemed to pretty much lack all emotion. He drove an incredibly rusty old truck and would go outside to feed the wild cats in the area every day. He seemed harmless. Weird, true, but harmless. Now one day, Jonathan and I are back home from work and he's outside, standing beside his truck. His eyes are just glued to us and shivers run down my spine. Jonathan tells me that he doesn't want to get out of the car because he's pretty freaked out. I don't want to let him know that I'm on edge too, so I reassure him that we're in the open, it's daylight, and nothing bad is going to happen. We get out of the car and I open the trunk to get my backpack because I was planning on grading my students' vocabulary quizzes, and when I close the trunk and look up, the creepy old man is right in front of me. His eyes are wide as if he just saw something that unnerved him. I jump and say, oh, I I'm sorry, you scared me, is everything okay? No, he responds. That woman that just moved onto the fourth floor is such a bitch, right? His voice reminds me of one that I've heard before, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. Well, uh, sir, I haven't actually met her. Is there? She called the office about these cats, and now they're going to call animal control on them. Oh, wow. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Yeah, I, I just figured you guys would feel the same way. This place is a fucking hellhole and they've gone to shit in the past year. He puts his hand up to his mouth as if he's about to tell us a secret. I used to work for them, you know. I'd open and close up the pools and clean up a bit around the property. They fired me a few months back once they found out about my lifestyle and they don't get our lifestyle. He says, moving his finger around to point at himself, Jonathan and I. I assumed that he meant because we're gay men, but even now I'm not entirely sure. Oh, damn, dude, that's fucked up, Jonathan says, trying to edge his way closer to the apartment door. Yeah, they're all just a bunch of cocksuckers, and I hope that new bitch hears that, he says, and at this point I realize where I've heard his voice before. The A Nightmare on Elm Street films, he sounded just like Freddy Krueger. Jonathan says, Well, I hope it's not too bad, dude. I start working there on Monday. Well, good luck. Try to keep your personal business quiet, otherwise you might be out of a job. Just don't turn into one of those assholes or karma may come back to get you. The old man said, chuckling to himself. Jonathan and I nervously laughed as well. Well, uh, good luck with the cats, man, and uh, we'll see you around. 
I say, putting my hand on Jonathan's lower back and lightly pushing him toward our apartment. All right, guys, nice talking to you, he said, still chuckling to himself. Although it uh, was more creepy than joyous, I admit. It kind of reminded me of the Joker from Batman a little bit, a kind of a maniacal laugh. Anyway, a month passes and we see the old man occasionally. The cats were still there too, so we figured things worked out for him. However, we haven't had another conversation with him, thankfully. Jonathan managed to keep his job at the office too, where there was not a trace of homophobia in the end, and that's when we heard the news. Evicted? I asked Jonathan when he came home from work one day. Why are they evicting him? Well, my boss says that the office receives harassing calls from him on a weekly basis, and even some other tenants have reported being harassed by him. I mean, yeah, sure, he's creepy, but is that enough to evict him? I guess so. They gave him a week to get all of his shit and move. A week later, Jonathan was at the office and the old man came in to return his keys. Jonathan was at the front desk and had already phoned for the manager, but the old man started whispering things under his breath. Get out of here. They're fucking cocksuckers, all of them. Get out. The manager comes in, grabs the keys and escorts the creepy old man out of the building. A week went by and we hadn't seen any trace of the old man. Jonathan and I are watching TV around 12am one night and I hear a knock at the door. I pause the show thinking that it may be a neighbour complaining that our TV is too loud. I look through our peephole to see the creepy old man staring at me through the peephole. A smile covers his face but it's really unnatural. I've never seen a smile so big in my life, in fact, and it makes my whole body just run cold. I start to stumble back from the door. Jonathan sees that I'm pale with fear and says, What's wrong? With a whisper. Uh, it's the old man. I whisper, tears welling up in my eyes. Jonathan gets off the couch and stands behind me. We're both facing the door. The man knocks again and it startles me back to reality. I start walking to the kitchen and I grab all the knives that I can. I tell Jonathan to go into the bathroom, which is the only room without a window, and call the police. I start to walk to the bathroom too when I hear keys start jangling against our door. I look back to find that the security bolt was not folded against the door. This works like a hotel room security bolt where someone can use a key to open the deadbolt. As long as the security bolt is across the door, it won't open fully though. I silently make my way over to the door, knife in hand, and slowly and quietly fold the security bolt across the door. And as soon as it touches the door, the old man bangs into the door, making me jump back a bit, almost dropping the knife. And then, it went quiet. No keys, no knocks, no bangs. And then, whispering. Come on boys, let me in, it's just me. Come on, it's karma. If I wasn't utterly freaked out before, I definitely am now. I run to the kitchen and close the door quietly so he doesn't hear us moving around and know that we're there. Jonathan has already gotten off the phone with the 911 operator and she said the police were on their way. Five minutes pass and it's still quiet, so Jonathan wants me to go and check if the man is still there. I look through the people and I don't see anything. I sigh with relief, but then I think to check the parking lot to see if his truck is there. I go to our guest room with a view of the parking lots and peer through the blinds. His truck is parked right next to my vehicle, and I see that he's in the driver's seat of his truck. And, worst of all, he's staring straight at me. Well, I can't be 100% sure, but it sure looks like we've locked eyes. I don't want to move out of fear that I've given myself away in the off chance that he wasn't actually looking at me. He opens his truck door, and that breaks me from my stupefied state. I run back to the bathroom and tell Jonathan to lock the door. I fill him in on the information, and about three minutes pass before we hear a banging on the door. Oh shit, I say under my breath. But then we hear... Open up, it's the county police. I go and check the peephole, and... 
It is an officer, so I open it and tell him what's going on. The officer said that he saw the truck outside, but no one was in it. He said that he was going to look around the apartment and see what he could find. Jonathan and I continue to camp out in the bathroom. All of the lights in our apartment are now off. We wait to hear from the officer, but within 10 minutes, we start to hear crazed screaming, almost demonic noises, hisses, coughs, screams, laughs, everything. My heart drops and I'm overcome with more fear than before. I mean, what's going on out there? Five minutes later, the police officer came to our door and said that he found the man in the vacant apartment directly above ours. When the officer got there, the man was allegedly standing facing a corner and laughing under his breath. When the officer put the handcuffs on him, he began thrashing about, screaming and hissing, and the officer told us that he had him in the cruiser and that they arrested him on breaking and entering charges. When the police officer left, we checked the front of our door where... They were now dents from the man's keys. He struck our door with them after being unable to get in. The next day we went upstairs with the manager of the apartment complex and we saw a small hole in the floor of the bathroom in that apartment. Which means, apparently, the man must have known that we were hiding in our bathroom and he was trying to get in there from the ceiling above us. Luckily, he didn't have any heavy duty tools to do the trick but the hole was made by a screwdriver being stabbed into the floor over and over again. So this happened to me when I was about seven and still lived in Poland with my grandparents. My grandma and I would always watch Lost together every night and then the news would always come on afterwards. But we saw that there was a sniper that was going around our area and they were looking for him and trying to find his location so that they could arrest him, etc. I remember one day at school, the whole school had gone on lockdown because someone reported seeing him near the school. And so everyone had to go to the hall and wait out the whole situation until we were in the clear. I don't think I left the school until around 7pm in fact. The police eventually caught him and took him in for questioning. Later on, when watching the news, we found out that he was allegedly hiding out in the small woods that we had behind our very house, and my granddad and I would go there for bike rides and walks most evening. The only reason we hadn't been going was because of this shooter. I refused to leave the house for a good week or so after that because, well, I was scared that he was still out there, and I wouldn't let my grandparents leave either because I would panic that something bad would happen to them even though we knew that he was in jail. To this day, I still have many panic attacks whenever I go and visit my grandparents and I'm near those woods. When I was 15, I was in a really bad mental headspace. With that being said, I was depressed, lonely and desperate for someone's attention. So, against better judgment, I made an account on POF. I understand that I put myself in a dangerous position for predators, but I also understand that any man who I told my age to should have just reported my accounts and not spoken to me. But, after swiping left and right for about an hour, I met a man that I will call Red. Red was 26, a father of two beautiful toddlers and a Puerto Rican native who recently moved to Florida. He spoke a fair bit of English and had this charm to him when he spoke. When I told him about my age, it's scary now to think about how okay he was with it. He simply told me that we wouldn't have sexual relations and that our interactions would be innocent. But we talked for a few months before even talking about meeting up and when I talked to Red, I felt happy, whole, like I finally had someone. The first few times we met up, it was pretty much fine. We went to the outlets, Disney Springs, the movies. He was a perfect gentleman, held my hand, opened doors for me and kept his hands off. I admit that we kissed a bit, but nothing too intense. About six months into our relationship, I turned 16 and I invited him to my house, through means of sneaking through my window of course, and he agreed. We were just hanging out, watching a movie, when he kissed me in a way that he never had before in a way that I'd never been kissed before. It was surprising and, without having to be said, overwhelming. 
I got scared and it finally hit me that this was a full grown man and I was just a child. I got off my bed and told him that he had to leave and his face contorted just into anger and he stepped towards me trying to convince me through gritted teeth not to make him leave. He reached out to grab my shoulders and out of instinct I shoved his chest to make him back off only for a harsh shove to be returned. Immediately, a sharp, hot pain just suddenly overwhelmed me, spreading from the back of my head and down the rest of my body. And then, everything just went black. The next thing I knew, I heard a blood-curdling scream. Hazed out and too weak to open my eyes fully, I just barely made out my mum. I felt wetness on my head and my body felt so cold now. And it was just as I gathered that something was wrong that I lost consciousness again. The following time that I awoke was in a hospital bed. My head was pounding and aching in the back. I reached up hazily to feel where the pain was coming from, and my fingertips grazed a row of staples on a now bald patch on the left back of my head, making me wince. But things went by fast from that point on, a doctor and my mother and father explaining that I must have slipped and hit my head on the windowsill, being that that's where the first impact was made before falling the rest of the way onto my tired floor. But my mum came to my room to wake me for school and found me laying in a pool of my own blood. She honestly thought that I was dead because my breathing was so faint, but they had no idea as to why I really slipped. And I was too embarrassed and ashamed of myself to tell anyone. I didn't think that I deserved justice for what Red did to me. Later on, I found out my obstacles for the injury, hearing loss in my right ear as well as the inability to retain old memories. This event and a few flash memories of my childhood are the last things that I remember from before the incident. And though I was saddened by this, I was happy to be alive and to never see red again. Now being 18 though, a few months ago I signed up for POF again. I kept my wariness this time though and didn't go on any dates. I looked out for warning signs and upon the first one, blocked just about everyone. And then one day, I received a message and... It was from Red. I had blocked him on any other platform including his number and it said, Hey, how have you been? I didn't respond but I looked at his profile and it still said 26, which was odd. So perhaps I really didn't know his real age. Perhaps I didn't know this man at all, being that he thought that he must have killed me and selfishly ran off without even attempting to see if I was alive. I don't know, but please, just be careful out there, guys. In 2012, my partner, our three-year-old daughter, and myself all moved to Brazil. My daughter and I have dual citizenship, and with my partner's skill set, it made sense to move there at the time to find high-paying work in the oil industry. After a couple of months of living in an overly priced furnished apartment in a richer area of town, we found our own place and moved in. Not a richer area, mind you. I was in the habit of taking long daily walks out on the beach in the nice area, and one morning after we moved, I decided to go exploring in my new area. I mapped out a walking route back to the beach that I'd normally walk out in the nicer area and decided that that would be good exploring. Everyone was asleep except my toddler, so I quietly strapped her into a stroller, grabbed my headphones, and went out to the streets. I walk fast. That's just how I walk, so I was pushing the stroller and listening to podcasts when this thin, young, light-skinned man, about uh, half a foot taller than me, I'm 5'1", in a windbreaker, zipped all the way up. Super weird because it's 8am on a scorching Rio summer day, suddenly appears next to me. He says to me while spitting on the floor, are you running away from me? I say no and I just walk fast. He says, oh, okay, because it looks like you're running away from me. At this point, we get to a street that we have to cross. He bends down to help get my daughter's stroller down from the curb, then back up again on the other side. And how nice I thought. He continued to ask me questions and I told him that I'm American, if he was wondering about my accent. I was wondering why he was talking to me and walking with me, but I didn't want to be rude to someone who just wanted to be a friendly stranger. 
And then, while answering a question about Florida, he interrupted me and told me to keep my voice down aggressively. Confused, I asked if this was because of my accent. I thought that he was trying to teach me, a silly foreigner, that I shouldn't let others hear my accent because then I'll be targeted. But no, he told me to look down and to not look at his face. It was at this point that I saw what was going on now. We were being kidnapped or robbed or something. I started trying to plan my way out of this. I started making observations. He's spitting a lot, almost like compulsively. There are a lot of people on the streets around me. There are a few businesses and more residents around me. He kept switching from being scarcely aggressive back to being really sweet and helping with the stroller. Every time that he would get suddenly aggressive, I would awkwardly laugh and pretend that I didn't understand him, and he would switch back to being nice. I really played dumb at this point. I decided that I needed to find a crowd of people that I could hide in. I spotted a bus stop across the main road with 20 to 40 people waiting by it, and there was my crowd. I needed to find a way to lead us in that direction. I continued talking casually and laughing while he switched from charming to aggressor back and forth. And at this point, my daughter turned around and asked who the guy walking with us was. I pointed across the street just beyond the bus stop and said, My daughter says that she's thirsty. We need to go to that gas station. And I turned towards the crosswalk. Luckily, he didn't argue and we waited to cross. While crossing, he asks again why I'm walking so fast. And at this point, I'm like visibly nervous and I'm pretty anxious to get to the people. I think he's sensing that and he asks if I actually understand him this whole time or if I'm actually fucking with him and I laugh and he switches to nice again. We make it across and now we have to cross another smaller street to get to the block with the bus stop and the gas station. He says, smiling, I'm going to grab you now, don't scream. I slapped my knee like he was a zinger and I laughed really hard. He laughed too, apparently abandoning his grab me now plan, getting closer to the people now. And my grip on the stroller tightens and he notices. He says, why are you holding it like that? You're fucking with me, aren't you? You do understand me. I look at him with a hurt and confused look and I deny it. He says in his native language, gun, you understand gun, don't you? And at this point, I'm right in front of the crowd. And I say, yes, while giving him a face saying that I knew what was happening the whole time. And I disappear into the people. He tried switching back to being nice and laughing and pretending like it was a joke so I'd keep walking with him but I flipped him off and he walked away disappointed. In Brazil, apartment buildings have tall iron fences or concrete walls to separate it from the sidewalk. They also have 24-7 guards. This bus stop was in front of an apartment building. The security guard saw the tail end of my encounter with the windbreaker dude and called me over from the bus stop. He let me in behind the gate and now I'm definitely safe and asked what happened. After, he called us a taxi and we made it home safe. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day that I shouldn't care if you're offended if you think that I'm rude. Before I share this story, I want to share the fact that this is my first Reddit post ever. It's a story that I've only shared with two other people in my life, whom I'm very close to because honestly I sound batshit crazy trying to explain what happened to me. So I'm from Roswell, New Mexico, born and raised. I grew up dealing with the bullshit alien nonsense my entire life. The whole town is a tourist attraction for people who believe in aliens and believe there actually was a UFO that crashed here in the early 50s. Gift shops, cheap souvenirs and just strange people galore. I like to think of myself as a very logical thinker and I've had many strange things happen to me in the past but I've always dealt with them in this uh, kind of logically can be explained way since I can remember at least. But what I'm about to write is something that I just cannot explain. And it's also something that I'm hesitant to even think about anymore. Now, I was camping with my cousin Cam, 17 at the time, same age as I was, his little brother Nick, 12, and my aunt and uncle. We were near Cloudcroft, New Mexico, up in the mountains. My uncle had just bought a new camper and we decided to go camping with it for the weekend. 
The weather was beautiful and me and my cousins decided to bring a tent and sleep in that instead of the camper so that we could be shitheads in peace. We set up our tent about uh, 60 yards away from the camper I'd say and the fire was right outside of it. Towards the end of the first night and after a long day of exploring we all decided to lay down for the night. We were not camping on an actual campsite. It was a spot that my uncle had found some years back and it was the perfect spot to set up camp though. At about 3am, the fire was completely out. My cousins and I were still awake. Nick being the youngest though, was trying to stay up to be cool with us, but ended up falling asleep. So it was only Cam and me awake now. We were just shooting the shit, talking about hot chicks from school, brilliant ideas for things that need to be invented. Male birth control was one of them, don't ask. And eventually, slowly started to fall asleep too. All of a sudden though, we just heard a blood-curdling scream from the distance probably about the same distance the camper was away from us, only in the opposite direction. Me and Cam both picked up our heads up off the pillow and said almost simultaneously, what the hell was that? It definitely wasn't a bear and I'm pretty sure it wasn't a fox, because it was big whatever it was. The closest way I know how to describe it is a mixture between a banshee and a rabid peacock. Its voice was deep and echoed through the deep woods. It let out another blood-curdling shriek and we both sat upright on our blow-up mattresses. And immediately after the screech, it started clicking. An odd, deep clicking sound coming from the back of its throat. It was loud enough too to hear from a distance. We were obviously scared and neither of us had no idea what it could have been. We waited a second, both quiet as a mouse. It let out another scream followed by a series of clicks but it seemed to be closer this time maybe 10 yards closer. I looked at Cam and he just looked as shocked as I was. I was trying to convince myself that it was just a bird of some sort or a mountain cat but then I heard it walking and it was definitely walking on two feet and I could distinctly hear it. Whatever it was it sounded big because it was taking huge strides cracking branches and leaves under its feet as it walked. It sounded like it was coming close to us at one point. It screeched and clicked loudly again and I could tell that it was about halfway to us now. Suddenly, another scream or click came from another direction, sounding just as close as the other creature. It sounded more aggressive this time, more angry and dominant. The first creature then let off a series of clicks too and then it hit me. They sounded like they were communicating. It was at this point that I became terrified and so was Cam. I had an axe nearby but I was afraid to get up and grab it. Then both of the creatures started walking towards us, both on two legs. Not screaming or clicking this time too but it sounded like they were trying to be sneaky, sneaking up on our tent. They were getting closer and closer and the first one screamed loudly and I could tell that it was roughly 15 yards away now. But so was the other creature too. After screaming, it started clicking again and the other one clicked back at it. They were both walking closer and closer to the tent and I could hear them both stepping on limbs and leaves, but I could also feel the ground thud with each step that they took. I was panicking, frantically looking for my axe while Cam was frantically trying to wake up his little brother. I couldn't find the axe anywhere and I realized that I had left it near the campfire because we were using it to cut pieces of wood for the fire. Nick was not waking up and they were getting closer and closer to the tent. Eventually, me and Cam froze. The second one had stopped about 10 feet away from the tent but the first one was walking right up to it. As soon as it was right outside the tent, I yelled as loud as I could out of pure fear, get the fuck away from here, leave us alone. And it stopped. It was right outside the tent though and I could almost see it in fact. It was huge as well tall enough in fact to lean over and look through the top of the tent if it wanted to. I could tell that it was really slim but the creature would have been heavy because of just how tall it was and for some weird reason I could feel like a, an energy in the air and although I couldn't tell exactly what these things were I knew straight away that they were not there to just say hi or steal our hot dogs. I was frozen and they were right outside the moon was covered by the clouds so moonlight was no longer shining anywhere. I couldn't even hear it breathing and it was just dead silent and dead still. 
The second one clicked from behind us, still 10 feet away or so from the tent. The first one didn't move, it didn't make a single sound and it was probably only a foot away from the tent. My heart was pounding so hard that I honestly thought for a second that I was about to pass out. When, all of a sudden, it took two huge steps backwards and the second one let out a scream so loud that it hurt my ears. I immediately burst into tears. The second creature took off into the woods, pounding the ground underneath it, running on two legs faster than what Usain Bolt himself could. The first one apparently turned around and just walked away back into the woods. I waited until I completely heard its footsteps disappear until I unzipped the tent, threw little Nick over my shoulder and we just booked it towards the camper. We go inside and woke up my aunt and uncle, surprised that they didn't hear any of it. And that was probably the strangest thing about this. They had no idea what was going on and urged us to take our asses back to bed. We obviously slept in the camper for the next two nights, and I didn't leave the campsite for the rest of the trip, in fact. I don't know what we encountered that night, but all I do know is that whatever it was, it was huge and looked dangerous. I don't think it was human. It definitely wasn't a bear, not a four-legged animal, and it definitely was not a rabid peacock. This experience has honestly scarred me ever since as well, and... Whatever I felt that night was also just really weird. If you've listened to this whole story, I really appreciate it. I apologize for it being so long, but I just wanted to do the story justice. If anyone has any idea of what this could have been, then please let me know because I'm all ears. I, uh... I don't think I'm going nuts, but three weeks ago, I started seeing a series of just weird things happening in my house. I'm currently living with my girlfriend and my little brother because he didn't want to stay in the mess of a house where our father lives in. Now, let me say too that the place that I'm living at was left by my grandmother. It is a pretty old house, rebuilt around the 1950s, and it's been in the family since her great-great-grandmother emigrated from Spain to Portugal. But anyway... Around the 14th of June, I came back from work to see my girlfriend, laying exhausted on the sofa. Fur, my little brother, was upstairs playing video games and I greeted them both and went to make a snack for my girlfriend and I. About 10 minutes after, the girlfriend opened the door, greeting us loudly. I just stared at her as if she was crazy and told her to quit the joke as I was in no mood for jokes. She stared back, confused, and told me that she had just arrived because she had had a really rough day at work and didn't want to bring any tasks home. I told her that I found her at the sofa when I came in and she just kind of laughed it off. At the time, I related this to just being sleep deprived and confused, but nowadays, I'm not so sure. So the next Monday, I went home to eat. I work fairly close to my home, and my brother was at the top of the stairs, just staring at me. I waved to him and walked towards the kitchen, but then I remembered that he was on a school trip outside of town. Upon realizing this too, I went back and searched all of the rooms. It's a relatively big house, but he was just nowhere to be found. I again related this to a weird hallucination, but... The image of the guy was just so clear. Thursday, I got the day off. Brother was in his room and a clear calling of my name took me downstairs. I clearly had heard my girlfriend calling me from the kitchen. So, I went to check and when I got there, nobody was there. Apparently, the place where she works doesn't celebrate the holiday that we were celebrating and she had gone out for about two hours before whatever it was downstairs had called me. On Friday, coming home from work, the same thing. My girlfriend was at the top of the stairs just staring at me and I stared back and we locked eyes for like 10 seconds. It felt like minutes and she just turned around and went towards our room. I again called for her and even searched all the rooms but there was just nobody but my brother and I there. She came back about an hour later too because her car had run out of battery at the parking lot and had to call her father to help her out. It was at this point that I decided to tell her what I had seen. She was a skeptic at first but then she told me to go and see a doctor. 
I got an appointment for Monday and they found nothing but the previously diagnosed stuff. No schizophrenia and really no reason to see hallucinations. The doctor also attributed everything to an uncommon series of hallucinations related to sleep deprivation and told me to just sleep better in the end. Then Wednesday comes around and I was cooking the meal when my girlfriend walked in on me cooking and she just went pale. Because she said that she had seen me at the stairwell when she came down. Let me clarify too that there is only one stairwell going to the top floor and only one corridor going from that stairwell to the kitchen so there was just no way that I just got there faster than her. But things like this have just not stopped happening too. I even called the priest to bless the house and nothing has changed. My brother has seen both my girlfriend and I at times where we shouldn't be there and things are disappearing around the house now too. I really don't know what to do and I hope that somebody with more experience in this field can help me out because at the moment I'm lost. So I was hanging out at my friend's house for the weekend as usual. My friend, who we'll call Chris, says to me, Hey, so I've got a date tomorrow and I'm supposed to go to this girl's house and have dinner with her and whatnot. Would you mind coming along and babysitting her little sister so that we could have some time to get to know each other? Chris was a, a bit of a heavier guy and didn't always have great luck with the ladies. I could tell that this meant a lot to him, so I agreed without hesitation. So the following night, we hop in the car and Chris is looking pretty snazzy and we're off. We roll down the highway for a good 20 to 30 minutes or so and find the place pretty easy. But just your basic little suburban type area. We knock on the door and Chris's date answers and lets us inside. And we're immediately pummeled by the unmistakable stench of cat urine. You all know that smell, right? And combine that with the absolute disaster the house is inside and we're aware pretty quickly that we're already cooking up a date from hell. Nevertheless, Chris seems excited and pretty unfazed by it. Now, if I were to go into every detail of this bizarre night, we'd be here till the sun burned out, so I'll give the highlights in a bullet point list. So the little sister was my age and was severely mentally ill. But Chris's date decided that I was a better option and spent the entire night literally trying to get into my pants when Chris wasn't looking. The sisters got into an extremely violent fight, complete with knives drawn, and the sister took a handful of mystery pills. We didn't see a single cat the entire time, which was weird as well. Chris's date suggested to me a threesome with her and her sister at one point. And now, somehow, for some reason, we were polite, funny, and amicable throughout this whole white trash fever dream. But both Chris and I were extremely uncomfortable, and we needed to get out ASAP. We didn't want to anger these trailer park witches though, so we thought that we'd have to be sly. So the four of us were all having a little conversation in the living room after the fight with the knives, when the little sister compared Chris and I to Batman and Robin at one point. And without skipping a fucking beat, I yelled out, Batman, look, Commissioner Gordon has the bat signal on, and then we just fucking ran. We ran so, so fast, right out the front door. They were all still laughing at our little goof until we started the car and just started peeling out. The last thing I heard from Chris's date was, hey, what the fuck? And this is where things got just really weird. So we sped away as fast as we could in Chris's beat up sedan. We take the first left, second right, and we're back on the main road to the highway. Only 10 minutes later, we're still in this neighborhood. We passed by the Hell House twice too, and we both knew exactly how to get out of this tiny neighborhood, and yet somehow we kind of got lost in it. We passed the house again and tried to take that first left and second right path again, and this time it works, which was really weird, but whatever, we're both stressed out, you know. We get back on the highway headed home, both of us talking a mile a minute about the awful night that we just put behind us and we even started laughing about it at one point. Our exit comes up and we get off, it starts slipping around to the main road and the next thing we know, we're back on the highway, three exits back. Now, I honestly thought that I was losing my mind and I didn't say anything, but like I said, stressed out, a little tired, who knows. We hit the exit again though, get off, loop around and 
We're back on the highway three exits back again. I honestly can't explain the sensation of it too. We perceived no lost time or any sense of lost consciousness. We were simply getting off the highway and then in an instant, we're like three to four miles back from the exit. The clock was moving normally and the gas gauge was noticeably declined as well. The second time it happened, I mentioned it to Chris and he says, Yeah, I thought that I was just losing my mind, dude. And starts driving slower. The car ride is silent now, we're both just too weirded out to talk, and super alert as if paying real close attention will stop it from happening again. But there was no such luck. And after attempt three... We started going faster and in total it happened five or six times and by that point we were pretty hysterical just screaming nonsense and speeding down an apparently eternal stretch of highway. We decided to pull off on a different exit and we get our wits together, hit a stoplight and all four signals are red. We're too tired to even think about just running the light. There are no other cars around. Chris and I sat there and just laughed like maniacs for a minute or two, unable to process the experience any other way. We decided to stop and get some gas and maybe try taking the long way home instead. I mean, what else can you do when you're stuck in the twilight zone, right? We head down the road and accidentally miss the turn for the gas station. No big deal. Chris takes the next left into our neighborhood to flip around. I shit you not, we made that left turn and we were suddenly pulling right back up to the house from earlier. Now, I know for a fact that the exit that we took was a good 10 miles from the neighborhood that Chris's date was in. In fact, I've been down that road many times in the last 8 years. I looked behind us and the road that we turned off was not there anymore. We apparently traveled 10 or more miles in the span of about a second. To end this quickly, Chris just broke and started driving like a fucking maniac. I was just as unhinged at this point and for some reason when we reached our exit this time, everything just went back to normal. We got back to Chris's house shortly afterwards and slept for the most of the following day. We've only spoken about the experience once or twice since then, always in passing and never really in depth. The only answers that we've ever thought of were either A. His date was a witch and hexed us when we left. B. We experienced a legitimate break in space and time. Or C. Some kind of a spontaneous shared hallucination of some sort. If anyone does have a decent explanation or similar experience, then I sure would love to hear it. Thanks. I live in the suburbs on a cul-de-sac where across the road is a forest which eventually backs up onto a river. Last night around midnight, my dog was scratching at the front door wanting to be let out to pee. Usually I just let her out into the backyard but it being a nice summer night anyway, I put her on a leash and walked her across the street to the forest so she could do her business. But as soon as we got across the street, she started tugging on the leash and growling, looking towards the forest. I looked up and... I noticed a dozen twinkling lights coming from the otherwise pitch black forest, as if people were shining flashlights in my direction. Freaked out, I picked up my dog and ran all the way home, locking the door behind me. I ran up to my bedroom, which has a pretty good view of the forest, and I began watching out of my window. I saw about a dozen men walk out of the forest carrying flashlights. They looked like they were wearing suits, but the only light that I had was a street lamp, so they may have been wearing full black outfits, I'm not too sure. A couple of them held briefcases, and about four of them were carrying a, a door or something. Yeah, just a random door off of its hinges. Then, trailing behind them was a woman in a white dress. They walked into the middle of the cul-de-sac, where the girl proceeded to lift up her dress, squat, and pee in the middle of the street. It was then that my neighbor down the road, who I'm guessing saw the flashlights through his window, started screaming, Hey, what the hell are you doing? Calmly, the group of people just turned around, walked back down the cul-de-sac, across the street, and back into the forest. I woke up my parents, who truly believed that I'd just had a bad dream until this morning when all of our neighbors were outside talking about the occurrence. Word started traveling around the block, and now everyone is talking about it. A couple of neighbors have already called law enforcement about it to keep an eye on the forest of our street. There are rumors going around that they're a cult of some sort. 
vampires, time travelers, etc. And I just don't really know what to think or believe, but I'm sure thankful that I spotted them when I did. English is not my first language, so sorry for any mistakes. So for context, I studied in a private school until the end of middle school. In my first year of high school, my parents started having problems with some money and they decided to put me into military school, which would only cost them about um, 13 to 14 US dollars per month. I didn't want to study there, uh, I never did. And to make it worse, they were only accepting students in the nighttime that year. I started the year and at first everything was great. I got a part-time job and everybody knew who I was pretty quickly because I actually managed to pass out in the first day. Boys started being interested in me and some of them asked for my number. I was new at this so I just ended up giving my number to everyone that asked but that was a big mistake. Two weeks later an unknown number messaged me on WhatsApp. His name was Bernard. He said that he asked his friend to ask because he was too shy and he thought that I was really pretty. And I said thanks. Well, the conversation ended there that day. I saw him at school a couple of times. Um, a few days later he messaged me again. He sent just a picture this time. I downloaded it and it was a fucking decapitated head. I didn't know what he meant sending that or why he did it. I asked what the hell that was and he said that it was the kind of stuff that he was into. And it was at this point that I just blocked him. My phone broke in the same month and I didn't have a phone for a while. I only got one on my birthday in the middle of June and he didn't wait a day. He saw me with a new phone and messaged me from a different number. He sent like 10 pictures of gore and I blocked him again. But we have vacations in July so I didn't worry about that for a month. It was in August though that things got really bad. So the first week after the vacation time was when everything started. The first thing that happened was the male bathroom. He wrote all over the walls, kill and then my name, I'll pay you. I was shocked. This was really something that I never thought would happen to me and at this point all of my friends knew about him and they showed me the pictures of the bathroom. Two of them went with me to the sergeant to tell her about it and guess what? The school didn't even move a finger to help. After that, I just started missing classes because, quite honestly, I was terrified and I'd feel tired the whole time because I wasn't sleeping. I quit my job and I wasn't eating and the few times that I did go to school, I called my dad to pick me up early. It was hell, but after a month, I decided that I should go to school or I'd have to repeat the school year. Again, big mistake though. A week going to school normally, I'd usually sit in a quiet place with a friend and just chat during break. And one day, Bernard apparently decided that he just wanted to kill me. The whole thing was really quick, but I thanked my friend for helping me. He came from our back where the soccer field was super dark. They would only let the lights on during soccer practice. He came super fast with a pair of huge scissors in his hand, ready to stab me. My friend saw it before anything happened and pushed me to the floor. Bernard ran away to the dark and we went back to class and I called my dad to pick me up. I couldn't trust the sergeant again and, I mean, why would I? They wouldn't do anything, so I decided to tell my dad about it. My dad was not even a little bit empathetic at first and I was crying and telling him that he said that he was going to grab the camera to record me because he thought that I was lying. He said that he would speak to the sergeant and make them do something, and he did, and the sergeant only got Bernard suspended. My dad made me study in the morning at the same military school, it didn't work, and I had gastritis because of the stress, and eventually he decided to put me into another school, and I was finally okay. But that, unfortunately, wasn't the end of it. Bernard had my number after all, and wouldn't stop getting new numbers to bother me. Eventually I changed my own number, but even that didn't work. He got it from someone else somehow, and he would always pretend to be someone else that I knew. He even said that he was a guy that I played Dota with. Some other time he said that he was a girl called Beatrice and even used a fake picture. I never really knew how he got my numbers at first, but then I found out that some girl I used to talk to at school passed it on to him. He would call every four to six months, and the last time he tried to call me was last Christmas. I'm still afraid of him and I barely leave my apartment because 
well, I'm pretty sure he knows where I live, and I'm trying my best to move out of the city I live in as fast as I can. I changed my number again two weeks ago, and I'll be okay for now, I guess. This happened a long time ago when I was younger and I have a really bad memory but this is just me recounting the memory to the best of my ability and what I was told. I also want to preface the story that this story takes place somewhere in Indonesia where it's commonplace to have maids in your household. So when I was younger I had a strong relationship with my extended family. To me it was normal to be close with your extended family and when I'm in extended I'm not too sure how they even related to me. In particular though, I was close with my great aunt's family, calling her great aunt Sheila, whose daughter-in-laws were like my big sisters. Being the oldest child, I liked being babied by them since I was always expected to be the big sister for my little brother, and this is important for later. I was maybe 11 years old or younger, neither my parents or I can remember exactly when it happened. I just want to say that as a kid too that I loved milk. I still do, though I tend to stick with skim milk now. When I was younger though, I had a favourite local brand that had the usual strawberry flavour. The brand was called Ultra Milk. I always thought that it was cool that I was drinking something pink as a kid. Unbeknownst to my parents though, a gift basket had showed up to our doorsteps and the maids had taken the gift, thinking it was a present from one of my mother's friends. My parents had even seen the gift basket and didn't think much of it. It was full of fruit and sweets, etc. The usual kind you would send someone maybe on a special occasion or something. In hindsight, it should have been a little weird that there wasn't a special occasion occurring, but another weird part was that usually gift baskets had a card or something to indicate where it had come from, but there was no indication from who it came from. But the maids had overlooked it and my parents didn't notice at the time. They had assumed that the head maid had checked it through, but she had it. And in the gift basket, it was my favourite tiny carton of my favourite milk, even strawberry flavoured. I had lessons with a tutor and oftentimes the maid accompanying me to the lesson would bring me snacks or food since the tutoring would take a few hours. I was at my tutor's house and she was teaching me about the homework that I got today when I got thirsty and I got my carton of milk to take a sip out of it. I was really ready to take a sip of this extremely sweet artificially flavoured strawberry milk goodness but... Something was just wrong. It just didn't taste right. I don't really remember what it did taste like, but I just knew that it was wrong. I remember describing it to my parents like I felt like I licked the bottom of the foot of a metal frame chair that I had in my room at my desk. It just tasted awful. Thinking that maybe it was spoiled, my mum had warned me about drinking spoiled milk and how it can really upset your stomach, I immediately, without swallowing grabbed some tissues at the table and spat out the mouthful into the tissue and was surprised to see a sort of weird metallic beads in it. Like metal but it was liquid. Now I have never seen anything like this at this point and I was really confused. My tutor was even more confused and horrified that I just spat out a strange metallic substance from my mouth. I didn't really understand what was going on but my tutor asked to take the carton of milk where I had tried to drink from and told me to just continue working while she went to investigate. Apparently my tutor and her head maid went outside and poured a bit more of the milk into a tissue and there were more of these weird metal liquid beads in there. She asked me if I had drank any of it and I told her that maybe I took a sip or something and swallowed before I realized that something bad was in there. After that, my tutor apparently called my mum and told her that I may have been possibly poisoned. I went home without finishing my lesson, becoming slightly concerned that maybe something was wrong. I went home and I don't really remember what happened after that. There wasn't a poison centre in my country and no emergency services that would really respond, the third world country and all that, so my parents just took me to a doctor to have blood tests. I remember being pulled out of school for some time. My mum wanted me to stay home from school for the next few days, which was great for me. No one told me the severity of the situation though, and my mum just told me that she wanted me to chill at home for a while. No school, and I get to have fun? No way, I thought. So, I did. I stayed home, and I watched Avatar, 
The Last Airbender on DVD while my parents were fretting over the idea that I might have been poisoned by mercury. The gift basket, which had already been taken apart and stored to eat for later, it was all kind of reassembled and my parents tried to go with this to the police but they really couldn't do anything since we literally had no leads on where this gift basket came from since it had no card and the police really couldn't care less about our situation. Again, a third world country. I don't really know what happened other than I was pretty cool with staying home and playing. My life at home wasn't perfect, got some issues with my parents, but they were really nice to me during this time, so I enjoyed it a lot since I didn't really understand. I think my parents kept a lot of things from me to keep me from getting scared, and my parents even took me overseas to Singapore, even taking the liquid found in the carton with them in a tin or whatever to show the doctors there, where I got tested some more and it didn't seem to have any signs of poisoning. I didn't swallow and quickly spat it out, so apparently there was no harm done, which was really lucky. I'm not sure if it really was mercury in the end though, but no one has ever really told me. And at the end of the day, everyone was glad that I didn't drink enough of it to get affected by whatever it was. Now, to get into the suspect part, my parents later told me that they had a sneaking suspicion that it was possible that my grand aunt Sheila was the one who tried to poison me. I didn't know this at the time, but around the time of this incident, Grand Aunt Sheila was found to have stolen gold and jewelry from my parents' store for years, worth thousands of dollars. My parents were obviously furious, wanted to report her to the authorities, but my grandma, her sister, loved her too much and instead just cut contact with her. Since then, Grand Aunt Sheila had seemed to want to enact vengeance over being caught and has been trying to get back at us for some time. My mum had actually warned me that I couldn't play with the big sisters, Grand Aunt Sheila's daughters, many more, since they did something very bad and to never get into a car with them if they showed up at my school, but it just didn't click in my mind until now. Thinking back, Grand Aunt Sheila was close enough to me to know that I loved drinking milk and maybe tried to hurt my family, even if it meant hurting her grandniece. We could never confirm it was actually her, but Grand Aunt Sheila has continued to be a thorn in my family's side for years now. Though, my parents have learned a valuable lesson and ensured that whenever we received a gift basket that there had to be a name on it. My grandmother doesn't believe her sister did it though, but my parents firmly believe that she was the one responsible. But again, we had no proof other than her horrible character. We've received weird gifts like black seeds and hair that were supposedly some sort of witchcraft thing. Witchcraft and sorcery is actually a popular thing in Indonesia, believe it or not. We assumed that this was all from Grand Aunt Sheila, who still lived in the same city as us, and it was the only thing that made sense. My parents unfortunately never bought me the Ultra Milk brand again, which I was okay with since that moment spoiled the Ultra Milk brand to me anyway. I was reminded of this story while drinking strawberry milk the other day. Different brand. I'm no longer living in Indonesia, not in the same country as Grand Aunt Sheila anymore. But even so, after drinking it, I couldn't help but think of this story again. My grandma was born in the 40s when folks were nice and nobody thought kidnappings were a common occurrence. She and her nine siblings often took the trains by themselves, going to and from the big city where they lived and their grandparents' place that was a four-hour train ride away. Usually they did this on weekends to give their mum and dad a break. Now one day, grandma was nine and about to be ten that weekend and she was going to her grandparents' house the day before everyone else by herself. Again, that was pretty common at the time and pretty ordinary. She got dropped off at the train station, got boarded on the right train by her dad, and off she went. Half of the way there, the train makes one of its stops and everyone is asked to evacuate because there's a malfunction with the rails. My grandma Yara is obviously pretty scared as she doesn't have any money to get on the train back, plus this was a bit different. In the middle of the chaos, a man dressed in a train driver's or pilot uniform approaches her and asks if she's alright. He's an authority apparently, so she sees him as safe and explains everything. He says that his next train is exactly towards where she wants to go and says that she can come aboard the cabin and ride all the way there as his co-pilot. She's obviously very excited and boards the train without a ticket and sits as his co-pilot as he promised. 
Halfway through the journey, she realizes that it's taking way longer than the usual trip takes and he's giving excuses that it's a different route. She steps away to go to the bathroom and he doesn't want to let her go and that's when she starts to panic. She manages to convince him and after about two cabins, she asks someone where the train is heading and they say a completely different town as to where she would be going. She doesn't say how, but she was crying and wandering the cabins until she miraculously runs into one of her uncles, who listens to the story and they get down on the next stop. He puts her on the right train and she makes it back safely to the city where she lives, not her grandparents. And so, apparently, none of her family made it a priority to find who this guy was. Though, I suppose it'd be easy since he worked for the train company and worked that route. Her uncle looked for the man a few times, but not with any determination. She had nightmares for years, and her parents stopped letting the little kids ride the train by themselves, and that was pretty much it. And for much of her youth, she was just petrified that she'd run into him again. This is a story from my childhood and one of the ones that still haunts me to this day. Have you ever seen those memes where it says people react like a criminal when an unexpected visitor arrives on their doorstep? They kind of freeze and just drop everything that they're doing and throw themselves to the floor to avoid being seen in a window? Well, this is my story of how I became one of those people. So at the time, I must have been around maybe 7 or 12, I was visiting the Midwest, Kansas to be exact, from South Korea where I was born and raised just visiting family, nothing major. On that particular night, the adults, our aunt and uncle and our parents were going to have a date night so our parents had ordered us pizza before they left and waited for it to arrive. We didn't have to open the door for anyone at that point. My aunt and uncle had two kids, two boys to be exact, when they were ages 15 and 8. Like I said, I was maybe uh, seven and a half at the time. My older sister was 11 and our baby brother was the young, tender age of three. So, all in all, we're ready to just have a night of fun games. After all, it wasn't often the cousins got to get together like this. They did live in the States and we obviously lived in Korea, but we loved each other dearly, despite the distance. We saw our parents out at the garage entryway, and they made sure that we knew the rules and we could recite them back to them. They also make sure that we know where the telephones were and the emergency numbers to accompany them. It was just going to be a typical night of no parents, or so we thought at least. It had been maybe uh, an hour, maybe two after our parents had left. We were downstairs in the basement, in the playroom or the game room, whatever people like to call it these days. We were down there just watching movies, playing air hockey, things of that nature, just being kids basically. We weren't being loud or anything like that and even if we were, it wouldn't be too big of a deal because the way houses were in Kansas, the basements are built into the ground in case of a tornado. So I had gone upstairs with my oldest cousin because I wanted to get a drink of chocolate milk and I couldn't reach the cups alone so we wandered up the stairs into the kitchen which was on the far end of the house. The others stayed downstairs continuing their games. We had maybe been upstairs for 15 to 20 minutes max because while I was drinking my milk, my older cousin was making snacks since we were planning to watch a movie. Then, all of a sudden, we hear the doorbell ring. I remember my cousin looked at me and told me to stay here because it was odd that the doorbell was ringing and it wasn't late but it certainly wasn't early anymore and I say this because it was summer and it was around 8 o'clock. When my cousin started to creep towards the door quietly, it was unnerving for someone to be ringing the doorbell. I mean, we weren't expecting any guests and the pizza had been delivered before our parents had even left for the evening. And before he's even halfway to the door, whoever's on the other side starts rapidly ringing the doorbell just over and over, this constant ringing echoing throughout the house. And at this point, I had looked over toward the staircase and... I saw our other siblings starting to creep up the stairs with the exclusion of the baby, obviously, who was still asleep in the crib down in the guest room. The eldest of the kids, James, put his finger on his lips and told us to be quiet to make it seem like nobody was home, despite there being lights on. He crept closer to the door as the banging and the ringing on the doorbell continues and he peeked through the peephole. And 
I had never seen my cousin look so freaked out before. His face just drained of color and he backed away from the door rapidly and he told us to go all the way downstairs but of course, being young and stupid, we didn't listen. Honestly, we thought that he was just playing a joke. Maybe it was some of his friends wanting to scare us since he did cancel his plans that night to stay home and watch all of us kids. My older sister shoved past him and looked through the peephole herself and, for whatever reason, whatever was on the other side of the door made her have the exact reaction and she stumbled back from the door just as pale. At the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. I don't think any of us younger kids really did, but something just wasn't right. After a while, 20 minutes, whoever was at the door stopped ringing the doorbell and all was quiet again. It seemed like they had given up, and maybe they thought that nobody was home. If only we knew just how wrong we really were, though. We all sat in silence for a while after this initially occurred. My other cousin, who I'm just going to call Kyle for the purpose of the story, mustered up the courage to ask his brother James, who was at the door, and why James and my sister were acting so skittish. James told us that there was apparently a man wearing dark clothes and seemed to be carrying some type of a package or large box, but he couldn't see his face. Of course, Kyle, being the little smarty pants that he was at the time, started to mock James, saying that he was just being a scaredy cat and didn't recognize their neighbors. But Kyle was convinced that it was just a neighbor trying to drop off a package that might have gotten mixed up in the mail, seeing it happened all the time. So we all agree that that was the probable cause until we realized that whoever was ringing the doorbell didn't just leave the package on the porch, which isn't that what most neighbors do? In the case no one answers, they'll just leave it most of the time, and why would they try to bring it over to the house at night instead of just waiting until the next day? But we thought it was over and done with, so we pushed it to the back of our minds. We didn't think it was important to call our parents and let them know what happened. I mean, it was over after all. We went back to the kitchen, grabbed the snacks, and started to head back downstairs until we heard the banging again, but this time it wasn't from the front porch. We were in shock, and we froze in fear. I mean, it was coming from right behind us. We turned slowly and looked back in the direction from which we came from. We were currently standing in the dining room that we had already passed through the kitchen, and it was like someone was banging on the kitchen window. You know the ones that were typically above the sink so your mother or father can watch the kids while they play in the backyard while they wash the dishes and whatnot? Well, James and my older sister, Nicole, got down on their hands and knees and they crawled back into the kitchen, much against our charging. But just as quickly as they crawled into the kitchen to take a peek, they crawled back to us almost in hyper speed and they told us to get low and stay low as we crawled into the den further down the hallway. James had us all huddle close to the fireplace, out of sight from the windows, and he told us to stay there because he was now taking charge. He was protecting his home and family the best way he knew how. James quickly crawled away, and I didn't know where he was going, but I was scared now. The banging was getting louder, and it was getting closer and closer. At some point, I started to cry, and I remember Kyle putting his hand over my mouth, and my sister was hugging us tight. And around that time, we saw James starting to appear back from around the corner, and he had his baseball bat. He had scrawled up another staircase to get to his room. He crawled past us and put a finger to his lips again, and that's when we realized that he was crawling towards the doggy door. He was attempting to close off the one entrance to the house that wasn't actually blocked. Thankfully, he managed to get it latched just in time because we don't think the man outside had realized that the house had a doggy door, but when he heard the lock click into place, the banging became more erratic and much more violent. Then, all of a sudden, much like before, the banging stopped. But this time, we heard pacing from someone walking back and forth across the porch, slowly and deliberately. We heard heavy boots thumping and thundering across the red oak porch and then, without warning, the pacing just stopped and it became quiet, eerily quiet. And then the man called out. Won't you open the door? I have a package for you. We didn't respond. We stayed quiet or as quiet as we could with the way our hearts were pounding and with how ragged our breathing was. The stranger called out again. 
Open the door, guys. And again, we didn't answer. The man called out angrily. I said, open the door. I have a package. Like before, we didn't answer and we didn't make any sudden movements. The man started banging again, this time directly on the panel window of the room that we were sitting in, and began yelling, I know you're in there. I know you can hear me. Open the door or I'll open it for you. There were three more bangs on the window and it rattled and shook violently with each impact from the strange man. Thankfully, our cousin's house had reinforced windows, so they weren't easy to break, but unluckily, we didn't have any neighbors close by, so we didn't think anyone could hear the commotion. But while he was making all of this noise, we took the opportunity to book it into another room and get to a phone. At one point, while we were on the phone with the police officers, they asked us if we could describe the man, and all we know is that he was tall and wearing black. So Kyle and I decided to be brave, so that if something did happen to us that night, they would at least have a better description of who did it. We crawled back into the den, and we dared to look out of a small corner of the window. We gently moved the curtains out of the way, and Lord behold, the man was still banging. He had moved the shutters off outside the window. They're basically hanging off their hinges at this point, rattling with the wind. We made eye contact with the deranged man, direct soul-searching eye contact. I don't think before this night that I had ever believed, but there's pure evil in this world, and when I looked into that man's eyes, I just didn't see a soul. I know it sounds crazy, but those were not the eyes of just a normal human. He was something unlike anything I've ever seen before. He was just uh, animalistic. Maybe the only word that I could describe it as besides demonic. It was evil and just unnatural and something that I never want to see again. When he saw us, he smiled just a twisted grin that I'm sure he thought was reassuring. And he crouched down to get a better look at us, I assume. And then he said, Don't you watch your mail, guys? You have mail. I can give it to you if you just open the door. I remember just grabbing onto Kyle's hand for dear life. And Kyle shook his head no and he threw the curtain back over the window. And before we even had a chance to move any further, the man started violently banging on the window again. At this point, James had had enough and he passed the phone to my sister and he yelled, Leave us alone, the police are on their way, you're not getting in here. After that, it seemed like the man panicked and the banging just abruptly stopped. And then we heard rapid footsteps on the porch. Kyle and I peeked out the window again and the man was running through the yard past all the trees. He jumped the fence, the wooden 22 foot fence at the end of the yard into the alley that separated the neighborhood from the old cemetery. We stayed on the phone with the police until they arrived and our parents arrived not long after but the man was unfortunately never caught. And we don't know what happened after that night because he just disappeared into thin air. To this day, I'm now 21. Whenever the doorbell rings when I'm not expecting a visitor, my heart drops and honestly, I still break out into a cold sweat. So I was 10 years old when this account happened in the fall of grade 5. My mother, sister and I were visiting my aunt and uncle and their two sons in Kansas while on break from school. My family is from South Korea, but my father is African American, so we grew up in both cultures and speak English fluently, so it wasn't hard traveling and interacting with others. My aunt is a devoted Christian and really loved bringing us to church with her and a family friend named Sandra. Now, I'm not against going to church, but I don't believe in a set God, so don't attack me. I do, however, believe in a higher power and spent a good portion of my time at a Buddhist temple where my maternal grandfather is one of the head monks and tomb keepers. So, despite being more spiritually inclined, I would get up early and put on my Sunday best and would stumble out the door, jet lagged, to make it to the service on time. The services always started normally, greet thy neighbors, welcome the guests, singing, and eventually the preacher would come out and read through the scriptures. There were times prayers for those in the community would happen, or people coming forward to be saved in the form of baptism. My family normally sat in what my aunt called the best pew in the house, but we didn't sit in the pew alone. You see, there was this man that sat between our family and another family of three. 
And this man between the families was actually a killer. A killer in the pews. Now, I know you're probably thinking, how do you know he was a killer, right? Well, hold on and I'll tell you about it. So the man that sat on the other side of my mother and next to Mr. Hopper was considered an outstanding member of the community. He was active in church and his kids even used to babysit around the community. All in all, he seemed just like the typical kind of American family man. But he was odd though. Something about his mannerisms just threw my family for a loop. Because this man used to lean over toward my mother to the point that his head was almost on her shoulder and he would take a deep inhale. And my mother would lean away towards me, almost crushing me and promptly would ask the man, can I help you with something? He smiled and just laughed a bit and shook his head no just a bit and muttered an apology for making us uncomfortable. He started with... Oh, sorry, uh, you just smell familiar. It makes me remember something. It triggers a, a deep memory in me or something. My mum had just laughed it off rather uncomfortably and stated that it's Sea Island Cotton from Bath and Body Works. This has been my mum's favourite scent ever since I can remember. It's kind of like a signature. And if you've ever smelled it, you would know just how fresh and clean the perfume is, so maybe he was just drawn in a subconsciously kind of closer way, like a, a moth to a flame or something. But as time progressed and service after service passed, he continued his sniffing ministrations. My mum had eventually had enough, and this man was creepy and couldn't take the hint to just back off. Well, we jump ship at this point and move pews the next service to an area more towards the back. But that should have been the end of it, right? But it wasn't. The man must have thought man overboard because he jumped ship and maneuvered through the worshippers to, you guessed it, right back next to us. This cycle continued as well up until we just boarded our plane to go home. However, the story doesn't end here. Now, remember how I mentioned the family friend Sandra? Well, Sandra was a dental hygienist in Kansas and she had a neighbor who was also one of her patients and she allegedly got found murdered in her own home. I won't be disclosing her name out of respect of her family and friends, but this woman, may she rest in peace because her body was found bound with a rope and a plastic bag over her head. It was apparent pretty quickly that she had been tortured brutally before she passed. Not long after the discovery, another body was discovered in yet again their own home, and mocking letters started being sent into the local PD station. If you haven't figured it out yet, then yes, this was the work of the serial killer BTK, which stands for Bind, Torture and Kill. He was allegedly back after years of silence. Initially, police thought it maybe was just a copycat killer since BTK had been quiet for so long. They assumed that he had died or moved away among other possibilities. The killings continued though for a bit longer and from what I remember, my aunt and uncle were on edge. The whole community was. A BTK though was eventually caught and I can't tell you all the details regarding that since I was back home in Korea but I can tell you that we received a terrifying phone call not long after. My aunt and Sandra called to inform us that it was over, the BTK was caught. Great news, right? We should have slept easy knowing that our friends and family were safe, but they were no longer prey. But BTK wasn't just a serial killer, he was the man from the pews, the one that sniffed my mother consistently. He was Dennis Rader. The thing that scares me the most though... My mum could have definitely been on his list. She could have been a victim, all because we sat in the pews and greeted our neighbour with brotherly love. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before just shambling off the bus. I figured that she was weirded out that I didn't wake her sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and just went on with my day. I mean, can't win them all, right? But I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized that I hadn't even asked her name. 
I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name. Lucy, right, I asked, and she said, yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say that she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks, I got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreaks and finding out about my personal life. I'm a serial oversharer, guilty as charged, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in by saying how fucked up things were and that she kicked my friend's ass for hurting me like that. I was uh, honestly a bit weirded out by this. Even at 16, I knew that that was pretty cringy and I was even going through my emo phase at the time, which is saying something. The thing that really bugged me at the time though was that she'd ask so much about me but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel kind of shitty, always venting and never helping her out. During this time she missed a few days and I let another girl sit by me since it was an overcrowded bus and I didn't think it mattered. When Lucy came back and saw me with another girl, you'd think that she was shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember exactly what she said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. But once her rival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. And nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while, things started getting kind of hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities, and any time I got upset about it, she would just give me shit for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me as well. But when Lucy was breaking me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time that she hit me. It seems like something that should be burned into my memory. Some kind of a cinematic moment in my life. But honestly, it all just kind of blended together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and playful slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive. That is, until she slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a shitty joke and she shoved me hard into the wall. She laughed because of the sound that I made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us, but they didn't do anything. Sometimes I wonder what they even thought of me. I didn't bump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right or it was an honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every single time I did, she had a new sob story that I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get in my head that she was some tragic soul and that I could help her. I convinced myself that there was something noble about taking the abuse and nobody I knew tried to step in and stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her though after three major things happened within a three week span. First, I found out that she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. It felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse though. She seemed almost uh, excited like I'd be happy that she was invading my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. After about a half an hour on my chest, not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at our stop and she has to get up. And she just looked me in the eye and told me that she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seems really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it or anything, just I pretend to be asleep on you sometimes. And I was kind of like, what the hell? The breaking point though came when she was showing off some award that she got from school. But there was something off about the award. It didn't have a name on it. But then I found out that it did actually have a name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem was, it wasn't addressed to a Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out that I didn't even know my girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into our usual fights and I broke things off. Lucy always was the persistent type though. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. 
Looking at her wouldn't make her stop either. It felt like she wanted me to know that she was watching me. But one day when she got on the bus though, she looked me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to a seat. I'm pretty sure that she was expecting me to say something to her, but I never did. The next year I graduated and I got a retail job. And end of story, right? I thought so too. It was the start of Christmas season and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store that I was working at, random chance. It had been a year and a half since we broke up at this point, so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend that it wasn't weird. She gave me the look, though, that the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nut. She grabbed something from the front and went right into my lane. She didn't say a word to me, but she just wouldn't break eye contact and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It honestly kind of hurt to look at her and I just rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. Then I looked at the other cashier for support and he told me that she was giving him weird vibes. And it was at this point that I got this really bad gut feeling after she left. Lucy soon became a regular at our little shop. She would come in and creep out my co-workers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came in while ringing her out and she said that she was visiting me. She never said my name but she always just described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite complaints because, well, the managers were penny-pinching assholes who would sell any one of us out to get sales up. I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard how often she came in, and after a while the stress just wasn't worth minimum wage anymore. The last time I saw Lucy though at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff that we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance so you could see right in front of the store proper. I left to put up the stuff in my cart and when I came back I saw her. She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance, just still as a statue. I kind of froze when I saw her and I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours before she just suddenly turned and walked briskly away. The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I got back, and she was a lot more awkward after that. And the girl quit three days later and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think that it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I don't know. I personally left the store not too long after that as well and got a job that didn't involve customer service. But unfortunately, that wasn't the last time that I saw her. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I had a bit of a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable and that Lucy was the only person that I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her, and with stars in the sky lit by street lamps, I saw her. She was with another girl now, and I got so close I could almost touch her before I snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and I realized that... I was kind of becoming her, so I just ran home and I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week though. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for dinner. I thought that I saw her in line but convinced myself that it was someone else. I ordered and I sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate and she took the table between me and the window that I was looking out of. She was actually with some guy that looked vaguely familiar, maybe a school friend. She was sat at an angle, so she was half looking at him, and every few seconds, she would look right at me. I knew that it was her. I mean, she changed her hair. It looks an awful lot like mine now, in fact, and after I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror, and I felt like I could die. Because it hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure that she'll turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping that I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up.
Lucy has been a part of my life for the past four years. We dated for four months in high school and she just keeps turning up. I mean, I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, I admit, but I feel like she broke me as a person and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I've developed serious trust issues, I get painfully nervous leaving my house and people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. I've tried to date since everything happened, but I, uh, I just can't do it. I'm just too much work at this point, so I've decided that I'll just stay single until I can work through my issues. I hope I don't see Lucy again, but somehow I don't think that that's possible. This took place when I was 19 years old. My family was moving to a new house and I was moving out of state. I had stayed a week longer to help my family get everything moved to the new house before I left. We lived in a pretty poor neighborhood, the ghetto honestly. We were used to shady encounters and creepy crackheads around the area unfortunately. My mother was moving from this area into a very rural country area as she didn't want to raise my brothers in a dangerous neighborhood anymore. And it was July and we had spent a good two weeks loading trucks, throwing things out, moving furniture and just generally cleaning the house. We had U-Haul trucks and family friends trucks loaded with our furniture on our dead end road pretty much all week back and forth. The last couple of days of moving everything to the new house, my mum and brothers began sleeping at their new home. I wasn't too thrilled about the lack of Wi-Fi at the new house and seeing as it was in the boonies and the cell connection was awful. At the time, my boyfriend and I were long distance, so my cell phone was my only means of connection to him and I felt the need to be in contact with him pretty much all day. I also was having a hard time with leaving a house that contained so many memories. But that was a mistake. I begged my mum to let me stay alone at the old house as the Wi-Fi was still up and my bed was still there. I told her that I wasn't ready to leave yet. I could finish cleaning it up so she didn't have to. I wasn't comfortable at the new house, etc, etc. Every argument in the book, basically. My mum was hesitant, obviously, and said no multiple times. She hated the idea of leaving me alone in a neat empty house in a bad neighbourhood. But finally, I ended up convincing her. I reminded her that my uncle lived just down the street, only a three-minute walk. I told her if anything happened, I would call him. He was reliable and always up at crazy hours. So my mum finally agreed. Around 8pm, my family set off with another load of boxes and headed to the new house for the night. And I was completely alone. I laid on my mattress on the floor for a while and I distinctly remember watching Catfish for at least an hour or two. I eventually got up and took a shower and put on my pajamas. As I walked back into my room after my shower, I flicked my bedroom light on and I stopped. I heard crunching outside distinctly the gravel on the side of the house outside of my window. I paused, trying to strain my ears to hear anything else. I began to convince myself that it was just me just trying so hard to hear something that my mind must have been playing tricks on me and making things up and my senses were just overly heightened. I took a small step forward and what I heard next made my heart very literally stop. The girl, she's still in there. A voice angrily whispered. I cannot describe the fear that flooded my veins with ice-cold intensity at that moment. I instantly dropped to my knees. My legs went limp with fear hearing a voice outside of my window. And it was at this point that I began to realize just how bad this situation was. I was a 19-year-old female, home completely alone at midnight. Bedroom window open and no weapons. I'm sad to say too that I just completely froze up. But the voice spoke again, and then a second voice. There was some indistinguishable muttering and then, go in, do you have it? More talking back and forth and heated whispering, and I was sitting beneath my window with my back pressed against my bookshelf. I was trying to hide myself beneath the window that they stood at. My curtains were very sheer and I knew that they could see in my room. They obviously quickly determined that I was still in the house. I heard crunching yet again but this time, retreating. I waited until I couldn't hear any footsteps and I dove on my bed for my phone. I couldn't dial my uncle's number because my hands were trembling so uncontrollably. 
I didn't think to call 911, I know, but I knew my uncle would get to me lightning fast anyways as his house was directly down the street. Just as I pressed the green call button to call him, I heard the front door handle jiggle. I let out a scream of pure fear, not remembering if my mum locked it behind her. I stood and I slammed my window and locked it and I heard the door handle stop moving. It was thankfully locked. Oh dear God, it was locked. I snuck down the hall to my mum's room and peered towards the front door and I saw a shadow walk past the front window and then silence. My uncle picked up his phone and I began instantly to cry and beg him to come over. He didn't ask for an explanation. He was at the door in a minute and out of breath from running. Shaking with fear and adrenaline, I told my uncle everything and he was on high alert and promised to stay up all night in case anyone came back. My uncle also explained to me that a lot of shady characters actually stake out houses when they see moving trucks. But they know that the house will be vacant while the family is moving and try to break in and steal anything left while they see the moving trucks are gone. There's also a lot of squatters that take up surveillance on houses being moved out of so they can swoop in the second it's vacant. Judging by the fact that the two voices called me the girl, my uncle thinks that they'd been watching our house the whole time that we'd been moving things. When they saw my family leave for the night and shut the lights off, they attempted to make their move. And lucky for me, they didn't take it any further and gave up relatively quickly. Though I must admit that the fact that they knew that I was there and still attempted to try the front door, well that still haunts me. Back in 2015, I studied abroad in Japan for a semester. I made some great friends during my program, some of which I still chat with to this day in fact. Anyways, I was with my friend Rick in the heart of the Tokyo subway station. He and I are both quite proficient in Japanese, so we were able to find our way around fairly easily. At the time this happened, we were looking at a map and trying to figure out the best route to our next destination. And apparently, we looked lost. Rick was pointing on the map when suddenly, two middle-aged women politely interrupted us. Our following conversation was all in Japanese, but I'm obviously going to put it in English here. So, the first woman said, Hello, you look lost. Do you need help? Rick replied that no, in fact we were okay, we were just trying to get to a location that for the life of me I can't remember anymore. We then showed her our planned route and she replied by saying that we shouldn't take that route, it isn't the best way. Interested in saving time and money, Rick and I inquired about the better route and this is where it started to get a bit weird. So the woman pointed to a location where we would get off, I thought it was strange because all the stops on the map were marked with a dot. There was clearly no dot where she was pointing, which meant that that stop didn't exist. I gave Rick a look and his face showed me that he understood. Well, while we were trying to figure this out, the woman suddenly says, Would you like to make some Japanese memories? We can take you there. I thought the phrase was odd, but they were probably going to recommend a tourist site or something. She pointed at a place on the map that did indeed have a stop but was over an hour away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. We said that we were all set and just wanted to get to our destination and that's when she said, Oh, come to the shrine, make Japanese memories, come worship Jesus. It would be such a shame to waste this time. I thought to myself, shrine in the middle of nowhere and Jesus? This doesn't sound good and we indicated with regret that we couldn't and we began to just kind of walk away. As we started quickly in the opposite direction, they called after us louder and louder saying, What a waste. You should come worship Jesus at the shrine. Take pictures. It's such a shame. Such a waste. When I returned home to my host mother, I told her about it and I said that I thought that they were a part of the Japanese New Religions groups, which are a fringe religion that have formed in recent times that are usually conglomerations of other religions and usually resemble cults. And she gravely agreed with me. To this day, I have no idea what would have happened had we have gone. Not that I think logically we would have ever made this decision, but... Perhaps they were trying to just recruit us to their religion. I mean, hell, maybe they really did just want to take pictures. Doubtful, though. 
Or perhaps there was something more sinister at work. I'll never know because I haven't the slightest idea what new religion they were a part of, but I just can't think of anything good happening at a shrine in the middle of nowhere with two foreigners who were lured out there. I was home on Thanksgiving of 2015, evening time, and heard some knocking. Being in a festive and playful spirit that I was, I opened the door without looking and automatically felt just a deep sense of regret, sort of. Like a literal oh shit moment. I didn't know where it was coming from until I started actively trying to place what was wrong with the situation. And that's when I realized that these kids that had knocked on the door didn't have any whites in their eyes. For a few seconds, I honestly thought, isn't Halloween over? And was confused until the oldest boy made eye contact with me and that's when literally I felt like I was just staring at death in the face. They wanted to come in and the way they spoke made me seem like they knew what I was thinking and were actively mocking my helplessness. I slammed the door on them, turned on all my lights and started watching TV while they just stood outside and would occasionally knock. I also felt like I lost a good six hours of time because I don't even remember when I fell asleep or when I was last watching. All I remember was when I first sat down, Gabriel Iglesias was playing, but don't remember anything after that. When I woke up, it was 2am and the lights were all off and there was just static on the TV. I have dish network and there were no power outages in my area and I don't get static if the dish goes out, so... That was a bit bizarre, but I'd get a channel listed as HDMI and then just a black screen, or it would be the introduction screen where it would show two people talking about the features of dish networks. Also, if the lights went out, they would always come back on, and I had to literally switch the lights on and off a few times for them to work. After that, I would occasionally see them outside sometimes, and every time it would be pin drop silence, and my lights would occasionally go out, or something would lose power like my dish. One time too, my phone that was at 63% just dropped down to 1% in like 5 minutes. After a few months of being afraid of every knock, I decided to call someone to bless the house. I also saged the house, and since then, thankfully, the visits have stopped. However... A few months after that, I remember hearing a blood-curdling scream and a banging on my door. I looked through the peephole and there was nothing there. A couple of months ago as well, maybe two or so, my mum and I heard a banging coming from the front door and the same thing. Nobody was there. I don't know if it was them or something coming back or just kids playing a prank, but I was pretty scared, I must admit. I was about 26 years old when this event happened, and it was about four years ago. So a friend and I decided to go on a two-week road trip from Kansas through Colorado, Utah, and all the way down to the West Coast. We camped the whole way, and honestly, we just had an incredible time. Other than occasionally having trouble finding campsites, that is, but one day, after a fun and gluttonous night in Portland, we decided to camp on Mount Hood. It was the middle of summer, so we expected to see other campers on the mountain, even though it was a weekday. We had to drive pretty far up the mountain in search of a campsite because all the ones towards the bottom were closed, due to fallen trees or trees that would be falling if a strong breeze came through and whatnot. We were excited to be there though, and we saw a couple of old men fishing on the way up and one family camping there. They appeared to be Native American, and there were about five of them. I don't think these details matter, but I'm just describing it as good a detail as I can remember so you guys get the gist of everything. But we drive up quite a ways more before we find a nice private camp spot and set up camp for the night. But we walk around, gathering wood, talking about the night in Portland and setting up the tent and whatnot. The time comes for us to go to bed and my friend Lucy falls asleep. I'm just laying there trying to fall asleep when I hear footsteps and leaves crunching. This obviously puts me on high alert since there weren't many people camping and none close by. I lay there with my heart racing and I listen. I begin to hear voices and I try to nudge my friend awake but she was pretty out and not really waking. I continue to listen and I start to make out the voices and the words. And this is the strange part because it 
was our voices having the exact same conversation that we were just having around the campfire not even an hour before. It didn't last long though before silence just returned. Needless to say, I had a very hard time sleeping that night and I'm wondering if you guys have any ideas as to what this is. I have an experience that I've told many people about and honestly no one believes me except my family. This makes me think that they've had similar experiences. They believe too that talking about these things somehow welcomes them in. So my family had a ranch growing up in Northern California. It's been in our family since the early 1900s. It's surrounded by forest about 100 feet away from the house. Cowboys would actually pay to take a bath on their travels and sleep in the stable at times. There's still a sign up there for the baths in fact. And we converted that stable into a home after the original house my grandfather built burnt down in the 50s. It's very isolated and my whole life we would just spend weekends up there. No phone, no cable, just electricity. If you got hurt or cut your hand in the wood splitter, tough luck because it's at least an hour to town. It had very basic necessities like a wood-burning stove, old appliances, pretty much everything you needed. But despite growing up there, we always carried guns, even to the bathroom that was connected to the house, but you had to go out the front door to get to it. It wasn't an outhouse, but uh, kind of. It's hard to explain, but as kids, we always had to be in groups of three or one kid and an adult. I did have little things happen that terrified me there, but was always told to not acknowledge it. When I was 21 though, my grandfather was having a hard time staying there all weekend and I loved it up there so I moved in with my dog. He was a big staffy, a, a pit bull, and went everywhere with me in my tiny red car. I loved that car too, and this was around 2009. So my cell phone worked up there, but I had to set it on a specific shelf and it was pretty inconsistent at times with text, but I could always call out standing on a chair by the shelf. I had a boyfriend who was an asshole. He came up every day though, but he never slept over because it even creeped him out a bit. I would watch movies and just listen to the radio, but not having cable added to the isolation for sure. Anyway... One day it's super windy but the power by some miracle stayed on. There was one light above the barn that barely reached my house. It had two front doors, one in the kitchen and one in my room on the same side of the house about some 15 to 20 feet apart. And my dogs just started going crazy at, I assume, either the wind or mountain lions. I wasn't about to let him out. The screen is kind of rattling with everything else and then I hear it right outside of my door. I swear to you that I heard a tiny voice say, hello, and then pause, hello, pause, and louder, hello. The weirdest thing about this though is that the voice sounded really weird. It sounded like a, a small person but not a child. But there was no knocking, and no response to anything I said, just the same word over and over but like they were trying to get it right. The L's kind of sounded like they were R's almost, and it was uh, really weird. I was so petrified, and my dog is freaking out with his hair up. I'm calling my boyfriend, and he's on the way, but it's like an hour to get here, and everyone else loses service out here anyway. I called my grandfather, and he was mad saying, grab the gun and do not open that fucking door. I was crying and begging for it to answer me. I asked if it needed help, does it want my phone... I was so scared that it was only saying hello and nothing else. I told it to tell me its name and that maybe I could help it, but there was nothing. Everything just felt so wrong about that situation, it's hard to describe, but I did not try and peek out the window. It was old glass, the kind that looks uneven if that makes sense, very easily broken, but everything in my body was just telling me not to look out that window. My boyfriend eventually arrived first and then my uncle. Before they got there, the voice became less and less vocal and then it was just nothing. Now, there is no way a person was wandering out there. 
The way up to my stoop was all in mud. The stable is kind of on a small cliff, so walking to the stoop where the stairs are is uphill from the house. Plus, when we checked, there were no footprints, animal or human, in the mud. Nothing touched or taken, not even from the fridge that was outside, near the bathroom area. I moved back to town not long after that, and I never slept there again. What really weirded me out about this situation, though, was the way my uncle acted. When he got there, like, he knew that there was nothing to be found, and he didn't ask me any questions. He told me to just keep my dog on the leash, and that was it. No one talked about it the next day except me, and I couldn't find any answers. I know that there are amazing writers out there, and I know that I am not one of them. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, I'm sorry if I can't give more precise details. A few years ago, though, I had an experience with something in my apartment, but in a completely different town and not like this. And I feel like since that happened to me, uh, I've kind of been marked or something. I do remember being very scared of the woods growing up on that ranch, like I was always being watched. And maybe I picked up on my parents' cues, or maybe I really was being watched. I don't know. Either way, I really love that ranch, but I just don't go up there anymore. But one more thing too, despite generations of family going up there every few days to care for the property, no one has lived there full time since the house burned down and we haven't kept animals up there either. There's no more livestock and not even a barn cat. One thing that bothered me though for a long time after this was the inflection that this thing was using as if it was a question at first. The way it spoke, I just don't think it could say anything else, or I don't think it would have. But the voice was also kind of confident and also menacing. The cadence was way off, like it was meticulously slowing its speech to sound human. And what bothers me the most about the inflection is if it couldn't say anything else and didn't know any other language, then how did it know to phrase it in a question? I used to wonder if maybe it had seen or caught someone in the woods before and then copied its words. But that's exactly what you would say if you thought you were being followed, right? Hello, hello, hello sort of thing? I don't know, but uh, I still think about it a lot and my heart still races remembering its voice. When I was in the fifth grade, my family moved because our previous house was starting to become too small for us. The house was only 10 years old at the time and in a really nice neighborhood. When we met our neighbors, they would tell us that everyone who lived there only stayed for about two years and then moved. My family shrugged this off though, thinking that the previous owners might have just found new jobs or just didn't like the size of the house or something. But over the years... I had multiple creepy experiences in the house that were always shrugged off by my parents. Random phone calls from the house to our phones, things being moved in the morning, even waking up to having my comforter ripped off of my bed. Most of the time I just thought that maybe I had moved stuff and forgot about it, but I would still get moments walking through the house feeling as if I were just being watched. Our dog would also just randomly focus in on an object and follow whatever it was, Creepy, yes, but nothing too terrifying. Fast forward a few years and I was home alone one night with a dog. I took her for a walk around dusk through the neighborhood as I had done hundreds of times. As I was nearing our house, I noticed that a light was on in one of the second floor windows. This window led into my parents' walk-in closet, so I figured maybe they forgot to turn it off. As I was walking up the driveway, I started to get that feeling though of just being watched again. And when I looked back up at the window, I could now see a silhouette of a person standing by the window. I immediately stopped and whatever was behind the window flicked the light switch off in the closet. Right after that happened, my dog took off towards the house and started barking at the windows on the first floor, circling the house barking non-stop. The first thing I did was call every number in my family to make sure that nobody had gotten home while I was gone. After each phone call, I started to become more and more terrified as I learned that each of them were miles away at the time. I explained exactly what I saw to my parents and my father told me to walk around the house and make sure all the doors were locked. If one was unlocked, then I needed to call the police. I grabbed a crowbar out of the garage and started circling the house, only to find that every first floor door and window was locked. 
and this was the point where I became genuinely scared and didn't want to enter the house for fear that whatever I saw might be there in plain sight now. It was this point too where I started to think about all the small things in the past that happened and how I'd brush them off as just nonsense. After about 15 minutes of standing in the garage with a crowbar, I mustered up the courage to walk into the house. The dog ran in first and immediately started running around the house looking for something. I followed her making sure that if something popped out I would be able to hit it as hard as I physically could. The walk up the stairs to my parents' bedroom was the absolute most terrifying walk that I've ever had. As I walked up, I noticed my dog was standing at the bottom of the stairs, staring at something over my shoulder. But when I finally made it into the room and checked the closet, I found nothing. Absolutely nothing. I was almost hoping that I would see whatever it was so I could actually have visual proof that something was there. I've never been more freaked out in my life as I sat downstairs just waiting for my family to eventually get home. Fast forward to today and my parents still live in that house. They've had weird things happen only a couple of times over the years but still don't believe that there was something paranormal in the house. My nieces always used to talk about a cat that they would see inside the heat ducts. From time to time I would also house it but rarely spend the night and if I did the TV was always on with a light too. Still to this day too I just feel like something else is in that house. I'm not a big believer in the paranormal things whatsoever but what happened three days ago has honestly changed my mind permanently about spirits and non-living energies. I've just never felt such a fear in my entire life and I've been in technically much more dangerous life-threatening scenarios but what I felt that night had me and my girlfriend both absolutely paralyzed in fear. I think my headspace is getting a little better now, but we were both genuinely considering going to a psychiatrist for this, concerned that we almost got some form of PTSD. So, this is a little bit long and requires some backstory, but it's worth it. And for the sake of pacing, I'll refer to my girlfriend as A. So A's parents usually ask us to watch their house for them whenever they leave for a little getaway or to go camping with her younger brother and whatnot. But their house has always had this weird uneasy undertone to it and we've had a couple of other instances of more creepy things happening there more than anywhere else i've ever been as well an example of this being that a couple of months ago we both stayed the night there in a's old bedroom while her parents were out of town and it was about 1 a.m and we both just woke up at the same time randomly after falling asleep a couple of hours prior well, we looked at each other and said did you just wake up for no reason too and then she said yeah and then immediately right after i asked the latch on the door handle clicked and fully closed that made no sense because well there was no draft from anything in the room and there was really no reason for it to do that and then what felt like around 10 seconds after we were just looking at each other kind of dumbfounded we just felt this weird presence is the only way that i can really explain it standing right outside of a bedroom door like, you know what it feels like when someone's just kind of watching you and you catch them? It was kind of like that. And me and her just kind of stare at each other. I was like, are you feeling this? And she said, immediately without hesitation, yeah, it feels like someone is just staring at us through the door crack. We just sat there in silence, waiting for anything else, and then it just sounded like shuffling outside of her bedroom door. The bedroom is connected to a hall with a staircase that leads downstairs, while to the right of the hallway outside of her room was an empty living area and to the left was the washroom. But when we heard the shuffling, it didn't sound like it was one lone figure pacing back and forth through the hallway. It kind of sounded like the shuffling was a wave of people, all moving like a current from the washroom through the hall and to the living area. It was extremely creepy and we stayed up trying to block it out, maybe telling ourselves that it was nothing. I mean, we were literally just discussing and thinking that it was anything else to convince ourselves that what we were hearing and feeling wasn't real. We eventually fell asleep that night, but after going through my most recent experience at that house, I know that what I felt that night wasn't my brain playing tricks on me. 
The most recent story goes like this. Her parents were leaving for a full seven day week to take A's little brother camping, asked us to watch the house like normal. We both said yes, and each day was going pretty fine except for one, and that was the fifth day in. So we both had the day off that day. The day started off pretty normal until about 11am, right after we had breakfast when all of a sudden we just had a bit of a light disagreement, but for absolutely no valid reason I just blew everything way out of proportion. I'm genuinely a pretty laid back guy. I very rarely get into disagreements and when I do I know how to let them go. And what I got upset about was genuinely not worth the reaction that I gave it. And... I really don't know why I was acting like this. I mean, it was literally about us not having any Kleenex in the house and A just said to use toilet paper. Like, obviously, not a problem, right? I don't know why too, but it was followed by the biggest psychotic break that I've ever had in my entire life. I was raging, screaming, sob crying. There's a lot that I don't even really remember and my girlfriend ended up reciting a lot of what I forgot when it was all finished. Apparently, there was a point that I was just pulling and ripping on my hair and staring at her saying, this isn't me, I don't know why my brain is telling me to do this. There was a point it led upstairs too where I was just standing at the top and I vividly remember this and I envisioned exactly how it would look if I were to jump off the top of the steps, careen off the side and break my neck. And all I could do was just continue having this internal battle with myself and my brain like, why the hell would you do that? I kept telling myself, not only the damage you'd be doing to yourself, but this shit isn't even your house. Shortly following this, A starts to clearly visibly worry and asks if she should phone 911 or my parents, which at this point, yeah, a completely reasonable thing to ask. And then I remember staring at her and just laughing, like actual psychotic laughter, and then shortly followed by just more crying. I then began crawling on a carpet at this point, grasping at the floor and at my chest. I straight up didn't know what the actual hell was going on. Like, I knew what I was doing was wrong, but there was something that felt like it literally overtook me and I wasn't in charge of my own thoughts anymore. I remember for a split second that it felt like I was staring at the back of my own head while I was talking to A, telling her that this wasn't me, like I had a mini out-of-body experience or something. And let me remind you guys too that this is something that has never happened before or since. I'm usually very relaxed and I seriously had no reason to be reacting the way that I did. I mean, I've had instances where I've been low, granted. I mean, who doesn't have that? But the sheer amount of unexplained rage was just not me. I felt like that day was just unmatched to any other instance in my life and all over something just beyond trivial. This instance went on until I got off the carpet and then I just felt somehow okay again. I cried and cried and told A that I had zero control over my actions in that moment and that I was fighting them as hard as I could. Like I said too, I've never had any instance of this type of behavior in my life and it all came just so suddenly that it just left us both shaken. I know that it sounds perhaps like a sudden case of a mental disorder, right? But... This is where it gets spooky. So hours pass after this incident and we both had a great rest of our day, felt totally fine for the rest of it and then night came. It was about 11.27 I think. I remember checking the time when it happened. We were in A's old room, cozy, listening to quiet music playing off the laptop and about to fall asleep when we heard two very sturdy knocks on her bedroom door. There's definitely nobody in the house, just us, and our eyes both shoot open at this. We look at each other, and we say, you heard that right. She says, holy shit, yes. We both just stare at the door. And I swear to you that the air just got heavy. I know that sounds weird, but there's no other way to explain it. There were no windows open, no draft, but the air just got really heavy, like you could feel how thick it was. And then we heard this sound come from right underneath her bedroom door. It kind of sounded like when you crack a, an empty water bottle, but more high-pitched. All I could envision was these three teeth-like fingernails grinding and clicking together on the other side. The second I heard it, I knew what I heard was real too, because... 
I looked at A immediately, followed by her eyes tearing up completely in shock. She looked at me and could barely speak. Was that a crack? I felt my face flush and my throat close up as soon as she said that. The anxiety in the room was just super high. I even looked at her and was like, I know this sounds dumb and maybe I'm overreacting, but should we call the cops or something? She looked at me with tears just streaming down her eyes saying, I literally thought about dialing 911 before you even mentioned it. And then, that's when the worst thing happened. Right after telling me that, we both feel it. We stared at the door and behind it, it felt like something was just growing larger in size and just getting more and more massive and defined by the second. Whatever was on the other side, it felt like it could have easily killed us if it wanted to. It was weighing down the room and it felt like a blanket of just negative energy was just smothering us. It was at this point too that I saw the most gruesome and grotesque mind-crushing mental images just flash by my eyes that I've ever had in my life. Flashes of just killings and malice and evil things and unavoidable circumstances and just terrible things. I thought that I saw flesh and meat and bones at one point and just pure evil things. And it felt like it all just kind of flashed in my head in the snap of a finger. But the strange thing was, we both allegedly saw the same things because I told her what I was seeing and she said that she was seeing the same thing at the same time. I honestly didn't know what it meant to be frozen in fear until that night. Like, you always see it in every cliche movie where it's like, why aren't you moving, holy shit, you have so many opportunities but you're not moving. But nah, I fully understand now what it's like. Paralyzation from fear is a very real thing. Anyway, after what felt like hours of just staring at this door, which was probably like five minutes, I forced all I had in myself to jolt up in front of the door, turn the light switch on and went to go and comfort A. But... As I'm trying to comfort both her and myself, she looks over my shoulder because my back was facing the door, and then she looks at me and her face. I've seen a lot of expressions in my lifetime, and I've seen her make many, but that face that she made towards the door while I was looking at her was the stuff of nightmares. The definition of human fear, and what I saw was only for maybe a second and a half, but it's an image that will be burned into my mind forever. I wouldn't even be able to recreate it, I think, or show anything remotely comparable. Her face turned all the exact same shade of pink red from her eyeballs to her lips to her nose. It was all the same shade of color. Her hair looked really tight. Her mouth and eyebrows moved in such a way that I've never seen a person's face contort so much, and her cheekbones were extremely prominent. And then, just like that, her face went right back to a normal-looking person. What I saw was something completely different. After about 25 minutes of all of this initially happening, we work up the goal to leave the house eventually. Leaving the bedroom was the most mind-wracking part, just waiting to see what was on the other side of the door. Somehow we both knew that when we would open the door that there would be nothing there, but it was definitely something before we opened it. But we opened the door anyway on the count of three and it felt like the second we did it, whatever was there on the other side just dispersed from the spot that it was standing. We sprinted to the front door of the house, went outside the front and called a cab. A was completely mentally checked out with leaving the house and I've never seen someone in so much fear and I've never been in so much myself. We were both shaking more than we ever had and I've never felt such a relief when leaving that specific location. Like I said, it all happened three days ago and the first two nights after were nothing but insomnia soaked. I just had to tell somebody about this because, well, it's been eating away at both of us. And so we've had plenty talks about it since it happened and it seems there's a bit more than I initially knew about. Because apparently, while I was having my out of nowhere freak out and was ripping at my hair telling A that I didn't feel like myself... She told me that while I did this, my eyes just went like a, a mat. Even though I was crying and freaking out and should have been glistening, my eyes were matte dry. She told me that she didn't want to tell me in that moment as to freak me out more, which was reasonable. And that wasn't me after all. But after seeing her face, it's just really uncanny that we both had a very similar experience. 
Also, it uh, wasn't until we got back home to her house that she told me this as well. After I told her about the face that she made, she looked at me and was like, I saw something and I've been trying to convince myself that it wasn't real. There's no way it could be, right? So I was like, well, what was it? And she told me that she thought that she saw a hand underneath the door and it looked like a white glove. And I was like, a, a white glove? And then she said that it didn't have any wrinkles or skin or anything, it kind of looked like a cloud. It swiped underneath really quickly and then just grasped the door and then you told me that I was scaring you. I looked at you for a split second, blinked and it was gone. I know it all sounds a, a bit wacko so I don't blame any of you if you choose not to believe me. I mean I found it even hard to believe her at first but the expression her face made didn't lie and to be quite honest I believe it. I mean what I was feeling seconds prior and even throughout the whole ordeal won't ever escape my memories and kind of backs up what she's saying. Anyway, when we eventually left the house, it honestly felt like we were escaping a nightmare, only to wake up to remembering the nightmare was real anyways. I'm 23 and I'm a descendant of the Whaley House in San Diego, California and my entire family to my knowledge has had multiple encounters with a being that either followed our family one person at a time or each of us is just more in tune with the supernatural and we've all gotten our own personal haunting or some bullshit like that. Now growing up with my parents things would disappear in the home and reappear in the least used rooms of the house and would almost appear to be hidden in them. Sometimes objects would be exactly where they weren't 10 minutes later in plain sight same room that you were in. There'd be noises in the attic above my room in the second floor. There'd be random sounds, hearing my name called from somewhere in the house where no one was, picking out of my room and asking if my parents had called for me and getting a no as a response was pretty normal, pretty much a daily thing in fact. We all had our own interactions with this being in our home and it was always a mild annoyance at most with some slight fear because obviously what can you do about a stapler reappearing on your desk after you needed it 10 minutes ago and it wasn't there and what can you do when the remote ends up in the bed in the upstairs guest room where no one goes. But my dad even has video of an I Love Lucy lunchbox walking forward on a shelf, teetering on the edge as if someone had gently pushed it thinking that's enough to make it fall. It wasn't enough to make it fall and so this thing slammed it to the ground instead. It was in the middle of the day while my dad was home, sick, alone, right in front of him and no shits given. But this story is to show that these beings don't care if we know that they're there. He would also game in our kitchen on the PC setup that we had and he'd play WoW until around midnight to 2 or 3 in the morning sometimes. He'd have our dog's toys thrown at him occasionally with much more force than a dog could ever muster. Maybe thrown isn't really the right word but tossed at him I guess. I actually saw it happen one time too when I was coming into the kitchen to grab a snack and it really messed with us but we both just kind of joked it off. I mean, if it wanted to hurt us, it probably would have by now, right? Push someone down the stairs, drown them in the pool, drop a toaster in the bath, whatever, but it never harmed us. Not even a scratch. Now, I know stories like this are a dime a dozen when it comes to our house is haunted, so I'm going to delve a little deeper into my personal experiences with this being that I've dubbed Jimmy. According to my grandparents, the Whaley side grandparents, they would hear me talking to a boy from the backyard without hearing the other boy's voice. They would look out the window and see me swinging on the swing like I was being pushed by something. They didn't interfere with it because, well, what can they do about it but scare their grandchild and ruin their imagination? And even past that, what do you do to combat a being that you have no knowledge on and that you can't even see? But my parents also heard conversations between Jimmy and I. They all sounded like normal harmless conversations to myself but I would answer back to a question that had been asked that I may not have been smart enough to think about myself. Answering questions of higher caliber than four year old me should have been able to muster up. I don't remember any of the conversations and as I've grown older he's interacted with me less and less it seems. I honestly didn't even know about any of the interactions that I'd had with the imaginary friend named Jimmy until my grandparents brought it up to me while I was visiting them. 
and they prefaced it by saying, we think you're old enough to know now, but your imaginary childhood friend was real and he wasn't human. We would hear you talking to someone, full on conversations, and we'd sometimes hear a voice that wasn't yours, but it never seemed outright dangerous or malicious, etc, etc, stuff like that. It's important to note too that none of these conversations were directly around other people. Everyone would at least be one room away or a good bit off from me when Jimmy would come around. After hearing the information about Jimmy, I started to get bits and pieces of memories back together. They're kind of fragmented from a childhood view which is how they're remembered. It's hard to make sense of it in other words. But I definitely felt like something was always there and always has been and it kind of reinforced that feeling hearing this from my grandparents. Now, I knew that I was haunted before receiving this information from my family, but hearing the name Jimmy in that kind of context brought a feeling with the name, sort of like familiar, a sort of curiosity or maybe even fear a little bit. I was pretty sure that he hadn't hurt me though, well, probably at least. But anyway, now for my personal stories and encounters, both prior to and post hearing about Jimmy. So I'd be playing WoW by myself at home while my family was out and sometimes I'd turn around and see a tall dark mass with red smoke filled eyes watching me from across the room and he would always disappear the moment that I noticed him. This didn't happen often but I always got that chill on the back of your neck that crawls down your spine. That feeling you get when some unnatural ass shit is happening around you. I would see it outside of my home sometimes too like it was following me in particular. I'd be in school sometimes too and feel a solid tug on my backpack to pull me backwards, get the similar chills, turn around and only to find an empty hallway and then just continue on my way to class. Now, that was as far as things went for a while as well. There'd be noises throughout the house here and there where nobody was, more so when I was home alone as well, but sometimes it would also happen with my parents or friends over. Living with it, you eventually adjust to it and just get tired of it and it'll start to frustrate you. You'll yell at it to shut up because it's 3 in the morning on a school night and you need sleep or you're trying to relax or whatever. And fear eventually just turns into exasperation. But one night, the exasperation turned back to fear rather quickly though. So, I was falling asleep and I heard a series of knocks in the house as I was quickly dozing off. All I remember from the dream that I had that night is that I got out of my bed, heard voices calling me to our game room from the deepest corner of the house, farthest away from where anyone would hear anything. I was drawn to the corner by some kind of um, a force or something and having no fear of the paranormal anymore, only anger and exasperation at the minor annoyances that I'd been forced to live throughout my life with, I walked to it confidently. It was darker than the rest of the room by a lot. And the closer I got to the corner, the worse I felt too. The dread took over my body eventually and I got pulled into the corner by seemingly a horde of demons and as I called out for help, I had no voice to call with. The words just caught in my throat and no matter how I forced them out, no sound came, not even gurgles or chokes, just silence. I don't know how long the dream lasted, being swallowed by darkness and demons, unable to scream, powerless and overcome by dread, but it stayed with me upon waking too. But that dream was seven years ago and I can still remember every detail of it. I still get that dream sometimes too, but that nightmare to this day. And I honestly just don't have the words to describe the horror that these dreams bring to me, feeling so powerless against something like that. I don't know if it was a dream or some sort of astral projection or what, but I wish that they would just stop. I've also moved several times since then and paranormal presences have followed me or I've found them every time that I've moved. I lived in Denton with the famous Goatman's Bridge and spent multiple nights out there by myself trying to find something and just enjoying being outside and alone. Being an only child and an outdoorsy person, I love being alone outdoors. It's peaceful. Most nights out there, I'd see nothing, but I always got that tingling feeling on my neck that something was just looking at me. When I would try to take people out with me, they would be all in for it until we got a little ways in, and then they would get the same feeling that I did and want to get out as fast as possible. And to be honest, I can't say I blame them. It was always a bit stronger of a neck tingling feeling with people there as well. 
I really don't know what's in those woods, but it followed me every move while I was out there, and I never once felt like I was truly alone. But I settled for mostly alone because, well, it seemed to leave me alone, and I just wanted to fish in peace anyway. Some nights, though, I see a really tall, kind of misshapen figure dart between trees or hide behind trees across the riverbank. I even participated in some pagan rituals out there, and on the last one I participated in, a monarch butterfly flew over and landed on my finger. Then, as soon as the fire was lit, it started to dart among the flames like it didn't want them there, like it was warning us to go. So my friend and I quickly put out the fire, and no sooner than we had, when I felt... uh, arguably the largest neck tingle that I've ever had. We got the hell out of those woods and the butterfly came with us. It seemed like it just refused to leave us and even got in our car with us. I dropped my friend off at her place and she took the butterfly with her to care for it and gave it some food and whatnot, a check it for fire damage etc and then she let it go. Eventually I drove home that night and I had my neck tingling the whole way home and everything just seemed slightly off to me. It was the the way my car was driving, the roads, the other drivers, even walking into the apartment was just weird. I don't really have a word for it, but it was kind of like everything familiar to me was just a, a little bit different somehow. I got inside, locked the doors, closed the windows as tight as I could, drew the blinds, and as I was lowering the blinds, I saw a tall dark figure with red misty eyes looking up to my third floor apartment from ground level across the way. The same kind of figure that I'd seen playing WoW in my room growing up. There was one other time too that my friends and I were going through a cemetery to get to their apartment faster. There were four of us in total. My friends, we'll call them friend one and two and three. We were scouting at the cemetery for the exit gate on the other side, couldn't find one and so we walked back to where the entrance should have been and we just couldn't find it. Now, I'm not saying that it wasn't there, I'm just saying that we really couldn't find it anywhere. We were in college and it was pretty late, we were a little bit drunk too but not shit-faced by any means. And the point is, is that as far as we knew we just had this big gate all the way around us with no way out. This obviously freaked us out a bit, so we started walking towards the far fence to their apartment and we were just going to hop it. Then, friend one says, Hey, do you think we could look into that building? The building was a small crypt or morgue type building. We all told him that we shouldn't and just wanted to get out of there. And well, friend one went to check it out anyways and as we rounded the corner of it, I had a great idea. I'll scare him by creeping around him. I told friends 2 and 3 my plan and hopped to it. I crept around the same corner that he did, made sure that he rounded the other corner of the building, then crept up some more, peeked around and I didn't see him. So I went around the corner again and just then I heard movement behind me. Assuming it was him, I laughed aloud and said, Haha, you got me man. And as I turned and saw him peek his head out around the corner and disappear again rather quickly... I then looked over at my friends around the corner. I was on the back of the building away from my friends about 10 yards away and saw all three of my friends slowly walking off, knowing that I'd catch up to them and laugh about my failed prank. The question is, who the fuck was behind that other corner? I looked around the whole building and I didn't see anyone, so I jogged over to my friends and told them that we really need to get out of this graveyard My friends know me pretty well and I'm a pretty comedic guy and I joke around a lot but they could see how serious I was and we beelined it to the fence and hopped it as fast as we could. I told them what happened when we got inside and friend one said the reason that he noped away from the building so fast was because he got scared and felt like he was being watched and now he's glad that he did. I can only assume that it was Jimmy. In fact, that all might have been Jimmy, who knows. I mean, I have a lot of questions and I just have so few answers. Is it really Jimmy? What is he? Why me? Why is he still here? Why did the butterfly cut off the ritual? It wasn't even a ritual for summoning anything. It was just a ritual to the moon on the night of the supermoon. It wasn't necessarily supernaturally related. Why would he pick me and stay with me from childhood? Is he connected to my dreams? Am I connected to him? 
These questions just go deeper and deeper, and honestly, it all keeps me awake at night. I've recently moved six hours again, and I'm living with my parents again as of three weeks ago. The same things have started up, and I went to bed watching an anime on my phone. It died mid-show, so I put it in the charger. I woke up in the morning, and my phone was on my dresser across the room, perfectly aligned with the dresser's edges. I hear banging again too, and I hear my name being called. And my biggest question is, what the hell does Jimmy and the paranormal world as a whole want from me? Why can't they just leave me the hell alone and let me live a normal life? Is this going to end badly for me? I have a lot more stories to share, and this is honestly just the tip of the iceberg. I don't know if I'll ever tell those stories, which is why I included so many in this one. It just depends on the reaction I get from this, I suppose. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the story, and it is 100% the truth, I promise you that. Whether you believe me or not, though, that's up to you. One of the scarier things that I ever experienced happened when I was about 13 or 14, and I started babysitting for my aunt. She had always been into Ouija boards and tarot cards and all that stuff. Anything that had to do with the paranormal, really. Well, while she was pregnant with her fourth boy, she continued dabbling in the paranormal. I told her that I was worried about her using those things while pregnant, fearing that it would somehow mess with the baby. She insisted, though, that it would be okay and told me not to worry about it. Throughout her pregnancy, noises would happen in the house, weird sounds, things moving... But it got so much worse when she had her baby boy, whom she named Austin. I continued helping her babysitting because she had four boys to take care of. Creepy stuff started happening when Austin was just weeks old as well. I would hold him, feeding him, and notice that he would look straight up towards the ceiling and smile. I never saw what he was smiling at, but then when he was about two months old, my aunt was gone, working at a job, I put him down to sleep and... He had a blue and yellow polka dotted pacifier in his mouth while sleeping. I sat down in the living room to watch TV and I heard noises from Austin's room. I muted the TV, got up and opened the door to his room. He was still asleep but his pacifier wasn't in his mouth. I looked everywhere for it as well and in the end I gave up and just went to the kitchen since he was asleep still. I got something to drink and a glass and when I sat down on the counter... There it was, that same blue and yellow polka dotted pacifier laying on the counter. I looked around to see if maybe one of the other boys may have gotten up and took it out from his room, but they were all sound asleep. Plus, I would have seen them come through the living room if they had. I know I didn't move it because I made sure that he was sleeping with it in his mouth. I've heard that they helped the baby to remember to breathe at night. But things like this just kept happening. When he was old enough to talk some, he also started talking about Daniel. Things like Daniel friend, Daniel mad, Daniel's here. I passed it off as just an imaginary friend at first. My aunt ended up pregnant again, but this time a little girl, when Austin was almost two as well. She had stopped messing with Ouija boards and everything too while she was pregnant this time. Austin kept talking about Daniel, but we all just kept thinking that it was an imaginary friend. After Jessa, the baby girl, was born, I started staying at my house more because my aunt had taken time off from work to be with her new baby and her boys. Austin started telling me that Daniel had started hurting him. He would pop up with bruises too and scratches and I told my aunt about it and she said that he'd been telling her the same thing but she assumed it was where the boys would play rough with each other or something like that. I asked if I could start babysitting again so I could spend more time with Austin and maybe he was just feeling lonely and that's why this Daniel character popped up and she agreed. Now, while playing toys with Austin one day, I noticed he had a big scratch on his back. I asked him about it and he said that Daniel had scratched him because he wouldn't hurt his baby sister. I asked if Daniel was bad and he told me that he would get in trouble if he continued to talk about him. I said, why? Will your mummy get mad? And he shook his head no and whispered, Daniel gets mad. So I just didn't bring it up again for a while. 
But when Jessa was a little older, maybe 18 months old, I still babysat because at this point my aunt was working again and gone a lot due to working long hours. And one day while cleaning, I shampooed the living room carpet. I told the kids to stay upstairs until it dried or sat on the steps. Austin was with me. I usually kept him close by trying to figure out what was causing the marks on him. Other than moving toys and things missing and little noises here and there, I never saw anything. I took Austin to the kitchen with me and the other boys were keeping an eye on Jessa upstairs. When I came back to check the carpet, I noticed large footprints in the carpet. Way too big for any of the boys to make. But Jessa was sitting at the top of the stairs giggling and then she said it. Daniel. Austin looked up at me and said, She's right, sissy. Daniel did that. And he pointed to the footprints. I told my aunt what happened and she said that she would look into cleansing the home. During this time, a holiday was coming up anyway, the 4th of July. My aunt and her kids would always come to my house to celebrate and shoot fireworks and eat and the kids would play, etc. The day came and we got started. Everything was going okay and everyone was having fun and then I sat down and started talking to my mother about Austin and his imaginary friend Daniel. I yelled for him to come over to me and when he got to me I told him to tell my mother about Daniel and just a look of pure fear washed over his face. He said, Sissy, we can't talk about Daniel, he'll get mad at me. So I just shook my head and I said, okay, I'm sorry, maybe we'll talk about it later, huh? But go ahead and go play. He turned around and started to run towards my house and out of nowhere, it looked like something shoved him really hard. He flew up at a good two feet and fell to the concrete. He busted his head open and had to be taken to the hospital, in fact. Sixteen stitches. I honestly felt horrible for bringing up Daniel, but that was the first time that I'd seen that thing physically do something. Everybody saw the same thing, too. Something pushed him with a force that only a grown man could produce. I told my aunt something needed to be done because obviously this thing was attached to Austin and was hurting him. Jessa could also see Daniel as well but for some reason he just wasn't as interested in her. My aunt talked to a friend of hers. Her friend agreed to help her to try and get rid of this thing. Terry was her name and she came to my aunt's house and immediately noticed that something was there. Said Daniel was angry and alone that it definitely was attached to Austin and wanted Austin to hurt people because he was angry at them for being alive and when Austin wouldn't hurt people, Daniel would hurt him. She started burning sage and other things, saying prayers and all that. Austin was in his room playing by himself. When Terry tried to go into his room, the door slammed shut. We heard Austin scream and me and Terry and my aunt tried getting the door open but it was stuck. Terry put a hand on the door and started saying something that I couldn't understand and then everything got quiet and the door clicked like it unlocked. We opened the door and Austin was lying on his bed sleeping like nothing had happened. I went over to him and pulled his blanket off. He had fingerprint bruises on his arms and his toys were all dumped out and his clothes were just thrown everywhere. All his drawers were open and Everything was just a complete wreck. Immediately though, Terry started waving the sage everywhere and chanting something. My aunt held Austin and Terry continued into every single room. And after that day, my aunt got rid of all of her paranormal stuff. And it finally all stopped. And after Terry left, we never had any more problems. Austin is 17 now and he actually remembers most of what happened. But he hates to talk about it. Jessa doesn't remember any of it, but my aunt never touched any more of the Ouija boards, tarot cards, none of it ever again. The only thing I could ever think of related to this Daniel was an old friend of mine. When I was between the ages of 7 and 11, I had a friend who was like a brother to me. His dad married my aunt and we became very close. My aunt and his dad ended up getting divorced when I was 10, so we lost contact for a little bit. I finally found him and we started talking again when I was 11. Everything seemed okay and he made plans to come and visit me. The day before he came to visit though, he actually ended it. He was 16 at the time and I don't know if this thing was him because I could never see Daniel harming any child, but 
Maybe it was something that pretended to be him, thinking that I would be more comfortable if there was someone I knew. But that is honestly the only Daniel that I could think of when all this happened. 